Greetings, fellow armchair Imagineers. Tiki here. And Blue Dragon 5. And welcome to the show where we wax poetic about the movies we on a month-to-month basis. It's time to crack open our... Movie Memoirs! That! Nah. Oh, God. All right, folks. That is right. Movie Memoirs. Uh, Dragon, this month, if this month has proved anything, uh, Code Geass brought up the uh, Taylor Swift just making all the money this month. Dragon, I, I I fear for the future of movies. I don't want the future of movies to just be like just concert films. I know Beyonce is already looking into it, so uh, we'll see. But Dragon suffice to say, the Taylor Swift movie hashtag not our target audience. Like we are not the target audience for that at all. So uh, we will not be talking about Taylor Swift here tonight. Beyond just like, congrats Taylor on uh you know just making all the money this month. All right, with that in mind, Dragon, let's get into the news. Um, Dragon, we have a kind of an interesting conundrum here where we've lost a lot of people this month, but a lot of them are people that are more on uh, on your side of the, uh, of the fandom space. So I'm going to kind of let you take the lead on most of them. I will chime in when I can, but uh, I'll go ahead and give you the floor for the most part with this until we get to, like, obviously, like, the big headline death of the month, which I obviously have some opinions about. So, go ahead. Yeah. I would say headline death, Tiki. We're not trying to lift like one well, human Dragon, I don't know what to call it. You, you, you know, obviously, we, we're not trying to, like, lift it up. It... There is one celebrity death this month. I, I think this Tiki, month we, that very much overshadows the other ones. That's we, all I'm saying. Tiki, I think we can just say the last and most shocking death. That okay, there we go. I think all that's right. probably the better way of phrasing that. Anyway, I'm sorry. So we also have a uh, keeper Colby in the comments saying a month full of stinkers. To be honest, I really um, hope yeah. he's talking about the movies and not the deaths. Well. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, Colby, you are you are not wrong. This month was rough, honestly. Um, we will get into it. Um, you know, I mean, obviously we have a, you know, Killers of the Flower Moon was probably the one exception. But uh, yeah, this was, uh, I, I, I didn't even bother to see The Exorcist just because of uh, how how bad the reviews were for it. But anyways, Dragon, go ahead with the uh, In Memoriam. Okay, so... Uh... I tried to put this as chronologically as, as, as they did occur, because uh, there were a lot of them. Uh, Phyllis Coates passed away. Now, the main thing to note with Phyllis Coates is that she was uh, one of the original Lois Lanes. See, uh, long story short, in the, I believe in the radio show, um, the radio show and, and the, uh, or at the very least, the, the Flesher Superman and everything, you had Noel Neal playing Lois Lane. And uh, when they did the Adventures of Superman show with George Reeves, originally they had Phyllis Coates in there. And she was good. She's an underrated Lois. She was the short-haired Lois Lane. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they kind of, uh, I don't know if it was a contract negotiation or what, but then they moved on to, uh, they got Noel Neal back for basically to the end of time with the original <laughs> The Adventures of Superman. Mm-hmm. But she was, uh, I really liked what she did. in the. Fr- I really loved the first season of Adventures of Superman. Cause I always, always lost a little bit of impact when, when it went from black and white to color. So when I think of the, my Adventures of Superman, I'm thinking Phyllis Coates with the black and white era. Of that mm-hmm. show, so I was bummed out to hear that that she was gone. Because to me, I know Noel Neal was in the live action serials, so technically she was still the first Lois Lane. But Phyllis Coates, to me, was like when I think of Superman, like being in, like the show. You know, she was kind of the first Lois Lane. So it was, it was, it was, it was a recognized name for me. I was like, oh man, yeah, for sure. Uh, Kogia says uh, it's impressive how long Phyllis Coates lived for. She lived a full life. Yeah, indeed. Uh, Dragon, unfortunately, I just don't have a lot of, uh, I, I've really, my only experience with the uh, George Reeves Superman is uh, that I Love Lucy episode mm-hmm. that we cover at some point. One I of really these days. don't have a lot of experience with it outside of that. One of these days. <laughs> All right. All right, let's see. Uh, real quick, uh, Keith Giffen. Uh, Giffen. I can never, I'm always paranoid about how to pronounce his name, but uh, Keith Giffen. The main reason I bring him up is, uh, you know, this guy was a great artist, a little bit of a writer, mostly an artist on a lot of the iconic uh, DC uh, 
a lot of the iconic are kind of more wacky, uh, kind of wacky that rose to prominence kind of side of the DC universe. He, he worked on JLI. Uh, he he uh, created uh, the Jaime Reyes Blue Beetle. So, you know, we had Ted Cord, but he was the one that came up with like, hey, let's kind of re-energize. Let's give like the kid the, the scarab. So, you know, he was the artist on that. Big one, Ambush Bug. You know, he was you know, one of the first meta, kind of one of the original meta DC characters. Um, Lobo, it's a huge, huge one, Lobo. Lobo was him. Mm -hmm. And lastly, the main reason I bring him up, uh, Rocket Raccoon, the other father of Rocket Raccoon. Oh, yeah, that is most definitely a big one, yeah. So this guy was good. He uh, he very much was kind of in that really unique 80s era of Justice League, kind of the more like the Booster Gold, Ted Cord shenanigans, which he had so much fun working with, and that's where he got the idea for Jaime Reyes, presumably. Um Okay, next one was a was a biggie, but uh, let's face it, it was kind of one that's been foretold to us in cinema. Um, Burt Young, Paulie from the Rocky film. Mm -hmm. Yes, we lost him, and he's also well known for playing uh, Bobby Bacala Senior on the Sopranos. Yeah, I'm just not. I, I'm just not that into Rocky, honestly. Like I. I love Rocky three. That's really about it. Um, so I unfortunately I just don't. I, I like the Rocky movies aren't really ones that I rewatch at all. So uh, I don't really have a lot of, uh, you know, the Polly character has always been there. Of course. I just don't have a lot of recollection for his impact. Well, even with the first movie, I mean, you still had a really good role in that first film as, you know, Adrian's brother. So I don't know, but point being Burt Young, he was, he was a classic man. And it was so heady to guess rewatching his episode of Sopranos in which he dies, by the way, he's introduced and he dies in, in one episode, essentially, and it was a memorable episode. He had a really good part in it. And I was really so eerie that, like the the same month, I'm watching that episode. He dies in it's just really that is head trippy. Trip. Yeah. Uh, let's see, uh, Richard Roundtree, Shaft. <laughs> so once again, this is this is someone where it's like I know the name, but I have not watched a single episode of the original Shaft show. Unfortunately, well, so well, I just have a lot of input. Well, movie. What? Well, Shaft, who's in the movies? Of oh, I'm sorry. You're right. It's, it's a, I, duh. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> yeah, but you think he was also in Roots. I don't know. Maybe that's where the, maybe a bit of possibly, think of. Possibly, possibly. So he was, yeah. he pointed out Richard Roundtree, great actors and a bunch of stuff. I mean, you know him from Steel. He was in Steel. Dragon, I have never seen Steel. Oh, really? I thought you I thought you did. <laughs> my, no, my, my biggest connection with Steel is the Nostalgia Critic review, and even then I couldn't tell you a damn thing about it. It's been forever. That's also, he was one of the, I believe, one of the African tour guides in uh, George of the Jungle, the live action. <laughs> oh, dear God. <laughs> action one. Well, but, there we go. Oh, okay. The point, <laughs> not the, not point... Quite the most distinguished role in the world for me to okay. like, form right. an association. Fucking a right. George of the Jungle, man. That was a fun movie. That it was. was. It was seriously. You really gotta go back to that George of the Jungle movie. It's a lot of fun. Dragon, I, I it was a childhood favorite of mine. Honestly, I, I, I have seen it multiple times. Yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> so like the point being, Shaft. It's the big iconic role. It's a huge. It's a huge uh, black iconic role. And also, I mean, one could argue we don't really get Luke Cage without Shaft to some degree. So, I mean, Richard Roundtree is hugely impactful in that regard. You know, he um, he was a breast cancer survivor, a male breast cancer survivor, which is very rare. Um, and uh, yeah, his uh, the last the one thing I want to know with him is that I saw him return in the big Shaft remake, the reboot that they did, which essentially had all three eras of Shaft. You had Roundtree. Sam Ra uh, sorry, <clears throat> Samuel L. Jackson, and uh, if he was, uh, I believe the actor who plays A Train and from the Boys was in it as well. Mm -hmm. Point you had three, uh, you had three really, you know, three really good eras of Shaft. There it was, I don't know, it was, it was kind of like one, it, we brought him back, and that movie was not great, but Richard Roundtree was the best part of that movie. <laughs> so like every time he was on screen, it was like, oh my god, yes. Uh -huh. Okay, this this next one really hurt me. Yeah, this is uh, this is another big one for sure. This is the one I do want to spend maybe just like well, like a of minute. Course, on. Of course, yeah, go ahead. By all means, this is, we can spend a little bit of time on this one for sure. We lost Richard Mall. Uh, Richard Mall was a delightful character actor. He's best he's best known for two roles. Uh, you know, originally his, his big role was Night Court. He was Bull, the uh, the, the the jaunty bailiff in Night Court. <laughs> You two need to fix my VCR so I can watch my Night Court tapes. <laughs> Dragon, that's my association with Night Court. That's where my association with Night Court begins and ends. 
Did you see the Red Letter Media video that they put out not too long ago where it, I, I think it was the, the latest Plinkett uh, appearance where they, they sit Plinkett down to uh, to watch like the Night Court reboot? Yeah, I saw it. He's just, it is very much just a, what the hell was this? This isn't Night Court. Yeah. <laughs> So I have no association with him in Night Court, unfortunately. But obviously, yeah. I, I, I know him from Two Face. That's the that's the main thing, too. And that's, that's, he yeah. did he did play one hell of a good Two Face. I mean, vocally, it's it's a very very distinct performance. I think. I mean, seriously, it's like one of the you know before we get Heart of Ice, we get Two Face, and Two Face mm-hmm. is like that. Two Face, I feel for a lot of people, bad in the amateurs. Not a, we were already off to the off to the races with Man Bat for with the man on leather wings the man bat episode for example but i feel like that episode was more just like this is this show is very stylistically cool Mm -hmm. yeah and then the two-face episode was like oh man this episode has or or this show has like poignancy to it it's got gravitas to it i mean two-face was like the big comic-con premiere that was like they went to comic-con for the first time with that and the and on that basically they play that cliffhanger there like you know, goodbye, Grace, and everyone went nuts. Like uh-huh, it was, uh-huh. but seriously, just he brought so much great, and we built him up. We made him likable, and kind of the brief, like little kind of pop ups he had up until the Two Face episode. So he was that was such a rare thing. Like, he was like Two Face was really like the main through line of continuity that we had in those very kind of like you know kind of almost standalone episodes of an animated series. There was a building continuity, but it was very deep in the background. He was a huge pillar in that, and. Again, just what he did in that two face two part, and is every time he came back, he just you know he was, he was having a good time. He's a character actor, he was really inhabiting a role. But admittedly, we never really hit like the zenith of what he did in that two parter, which was a really great varied performance. That's that, that's true. Yeah, that is a that is a definitely a point for sure. Yeah, and that's not to say he didn't do good work when he came back. Because I mean, for example, I always love that second chance episode. You know, where Two Face, you know, it's, it's kind of a fun little mystery who kidnapped Two Face and everything. All that. Yeah, anyway. I imagine the writers must have like been like, "Oh man, we really, uh, <laughs> like, we really hit the peak with Two Face right there." Like, you know, like what? Where do we go from here? I mean, that's the thing. Like, they told the the definitive Two Face origin episode and everything. So, I right. mean, when the, when the Dark Knight comes out, they're measuring up to that episode. I mean, you know, that's, uh, that's the uh-huh. thing. Anyway, um, but the main the main thing I want to hear is that you know uh, he. Very much, you know, he had the occasional bit parts here and there. Like the other thing I really know him from in live action is he popped up in Jingle All the Way as uh, as the uh, the fictionalized version of uh, Dement- uh, Dementor. Oh, okay. <laughs> but from the opening, when you see like that Tata Turbo Man, like he's the guy from the opening who's actually uh-huh. the real Dement before you know, and Myron takes over the role <laughs> later on. Um, anyway, um, point being, there was a really nice send send off for him where. He had not really done voice work for a long time. Uh, the other, the other big role that he had, by the way, was Spider-Man: The Animated Series. He was the Scorpion from the '90s Spider-Man show, and he, that was good too. It was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, point being, um, in Batman: Brave and the Bold, he came back, and that was the big episode, Chill of the Night, where they got Kevin Conroy back. They got you know, there's the Phantom Stranger, Mark Hamill, Adam West, like every Julie Newmore. They got everyone back for that episode, and yeah, Kogias actually just uh, just cited. Mm-hmm. Chill of the night right there, yeah. So he played Lou Moxon, the man who commissioned the Wayne murder, and Two-Face is in there with a big ensemble uh, for the third act of that episode. So in a sense, after so many years, Tiki, he came back one last time to play Mm Two-Face. It was a bit part, but he came back. So he'll be missed. Just That's all I really want to insist. Richard Maul was was tremendous. All right, and then the big one, man, Mm -hmm. and the one that, I mean, I don't, honestly, Dragon, I don't want to, like, really joke too much about the whole, like, I went on a trip and it killed him, but, like, when I saw the, when I, when I saw the news, Dragon, it definitely, it definitely, uh, went through my mind, I'm like, oh, no, so, yeah, we, uh, Dragon, isn't it, it's so surreal, like I swear to God, ever since it happened, like I, 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 I keep seeing the friends line up, and it's so surreal to think that one of them's gone. Um, of course, we're talking Matthew Perry. I mean, it's it, it doesn't even feel real yet, honestly. It's it, because it's like those characters just, you know, they are such an integral part of uh, people's day to day lives for you know a long time when that show was uh, 
you know, at the height of its powers. And I, I, I don't know. And uh, like Matthew Perry, obviously he's, he's had his uh, struggles with substance abuse in the past, but dragon, correct me if I'm wrong. As far as I know, this was uh, a drowning in, in a hot tub where there was no substances involved. Right. Is that, is that right? I mean, you know, they're probably keeping a lot of stuff close to the vest right now as they're kind of determining things, but publicly it is said that there, there were no substances found. Like, that's what they're saying. So, so that's no. like, that's the really tragic thing because it's like, it is so easy to die in a hot tub when you are, you know, under the influence. Like, that mm -hmm. is like one of the big things they warn you about if you're doing drugs or heavily drinking or something is don't get into hot tubs. I mean, I mean right now it's kind of the Bob Saget thing or Bob Saget presumably is just like, he kind of like, he kind of woke up, bonked his head and that was it. You know, it's, it's, it's just a freak accident, man. And it just kind of like makes me, it almost kind of makes me sick how much of a, you know, of a chance random thing it was. You know what I mean? I mean, you know that thing when someone dies and we're always, it's kind of the Kennedy thing where it's like, where were you when it happened? And in this case, it's... I was in a San Diego hotel well, room. <laughs> well, yeah, but I'm, I'm moving on from the geographic sticky. It's the fact that we're... It's that thing where we always kind of relate it to ourselves. And like the last thing we recall with like, I, oh, I was just doing this with that person. I was just doing this in relation to that person, for me, it was like, you know, I earlier, like, it was either early this year or um, end of last year, I read, Matthew Perry put out his book, and I read it, uh, his, his, his biography, and I kind of got to know the guy a little bit. It was like so heady to me that after, after you know, learning a bit about his struggles and everything, and kind of like, okay, he was in a good place by the end of that book, you know, after all the stuff that he went through, and, you know, because of the, the Friends reunion and everything, and, and it's like now he's like, oh man, that it was, it was so it was that's where I got the whole unreal thing you're talking about. We're like, yeah, he's it's un, it, it's, it's unbelievable, like 54 out of nowhere, hot dog. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I and by all accounts, much like Bob Saget, I, I feel like most everyone, like, I there's no one who has a bad word to say about him. I mean, he genuinely, I, like like I said, he had his struggles with substances <laughs> mm -hmm. back when Friends was at the height of its popularity. But even still, even through that, no one really had any bad words to say like, about him. Like, the words he was... We all call him a sweetheart. Even though he was a little avid on set, he was still nice to people. And, you know, right, he was like, right. like no one he, never, he tried to not... It's like he didn't bring anything to the scene and do it like while he was there. It was just kind of a thing like he would feel like hangovers and stuff from the night before uh -huh. to kind of tell on the guy. That's the thing, you know, that's the thing. Perry had a lot of, there's a lot, it's not just, it was kind of drugs and medical problems as a result of, 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 of drug struggles, but still, it's the fact that this guy, you know, he did do a lot of good too. He did a lot of charity work in response to all the stuff that he had been through, you know. He, uh, I love that in addition to Friends, he was able to do a, well, essentially it was a passion project for him. He was able to do the Odd Couple show with Thomas Lennon, which, uh, you know, that was, uh, look, it's no original Odd Couple show, but it was like, you know, like the, <laughs> the, the you know, the, um, the one with Tony Randall. Sure. But it's still, you know, it was, uh, I was so tickled pink, like, you know what, they're making a good run, Ed, and Thomas Lennon's wonderful and it's very well cast. And I would not, Matt Perry would not have been my first choice for Oscar Madison, but you know what? Play, bouncing off of Thomas Lennon, I think I think it worked really well. It was like, if you're going to do a modern update on the Odd Couple, you know, it's yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. So it's a shame. It is uh, we've we've lost a friend here, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's sad. Okay, uh, Keeper Colby said uh, we have a wallaby named Chandler Bing, and I was doing a show right after the news broke, and that's how I found out. Mm. Uh, if you don't know Dragon, he, he I think I've told you this, he 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 is a zookeeper, so he you know, he is around animals like that a lot. So yeah. Ah. Um some lady laughed in the That would have been really random if Keeper Colby just happened to randomly had like a wallaby as a pet or something. I know, right? <laughs> so just wanted to clarify that. All right, well Jesus Christ, eh? We're we're out of the woods with the uh with the deaths now. Um so Moving but, on you know, to other bad news. I know, right? That's how we like to do. We like to ease out, 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 out of the terribleness. I mean, Dragon, the strikes, I just don't know at this point. I really, like... Dragon, I'll let you say whatever you whatever updates you have. The one thing I want to add here is uh, I do think that it's kind of a good sign, I guess, that I know... A couple productions, like I know Priscilla got this, I know The Hunger Games is getting it, where they're basically getting waivers uh, to do promotion on a case-by-case -case basis. So it's like, I, I, I don't know, but 
man, it, it it's so bad. It, it's so bad. I mean, this strike is just like as someone who runs a nerd culture YouTube channel, it's it's very concerning because there's just not going to be any nerd culture left after this shit. <laughs> Yeah, it's so it's so crazy that we have like back to back strikes going on. You know, that's it's insane. Yeah, but uh, yeah. So essentially, the update is the uh, long story short. Uh, this month, the studios have have really botched negotiations. Uh, like they're bringing offers to the table that were that were very low, and the actors aren't taking. It. I mean, to be frank, it feels a lot like the actors really just what they should have done is basically got exactly what the writers got which specifically for the actors is we just need the ai protection it's essentially what they should have gotten should have been a closed matter but it seems like they're holding that for money that the writers got because well they got some we should get some too and that's where things are getting really muddy right now that's that's a layman's perspective on what's going on but that's kind of what it feels like that's why it feels like where things are kind of dragging on maybe longer than it should. I mean, again, it, it's kind of a failure on both sides. And unfortunately, I have I have definitely seen people like comment on the actors getting greedy, and I frankly I think there's some truth to it. You know, yeah, there's a little bit, a little bit. A little bit All and... they should have done is just say we want the AI protection, which is a very reasonable thing right. to ask because they're technically the actors are getting residuals. Not it's a whole thing with. I know it's, it's still the fact the actress period got residuals. The writers did not really get residuals. Mm. At least anyway, well, not to get bogged down in semantics. The point being, because of all this, we had like the stupid ho- the Halloween rule <laughs> imposed upon the actors, which a lot of them were scoffing at that they weren't allowed to dress in like studio related costumes. Like they couldn't dress as their characters from movies and stuff. Okay, you see, that's what I'm saying, man. Like, like on the Fran Drescher side of things, it, like, I think there's been a lot of really stupid ass rules, you know, that she has put into place. Like, I, I really do. I really think that some of some of this stuff is definitely it's a two side. Like, like you said, Dragon. At this point, I feel like both parties are at fault. I mean, you know, like on one hand, SNL really kind of reamed, reamed Fran Drescher goods. <laughs> they did a sketch about the whole. Oh, Halloween I need to see debacle. that. <laughs> yeah, you should. You should watch it. It's it's pretty. It's it's funny. It's basically uh-huh. them making fun of like Fran Drescher saying, "No, don't do that." <laughs> so, well, you should watch it. I'm gonna you know, botch it here. The point <laughs> being, sure, sure. The point being, um. I mean, the one point that she did have was like, "Hey, you, why don't you go as the classic Universal monsters?" There you go. There's just go the classic. It goes the classic off-brand ones. I mean, it's not a worst idea, but still, it's like I you know, think that the like she is just being way too stubborn about the promotion thing in general, and frankly, I think it's like not helping anything. Well, no, no, you're no. Take, no also, you're, also, you're right, Tig. I'm just saying that it just feels like have a fun. It almost feels like. A, it had spun a different way. It feels like, hey, why don't we go to the classic movie monsters this year? Like, okay, that's kind of a. <laughs> <laughs> but again, she wasn't really spun that it was. We want to stick it to the system, man. <laughs> Versus, like, here's a fun alternative. Uh huh. Anyway, uh, Cranston, he's rallying the troops, telling the actors not to, you know, not not to give in. Which I mean, it's admirable. And I get, I get that we're trying not, we're not, we're trying not to let the studios win or basically bully the actors by starving out the little guys until they're desperate to make it. I, I get it, but again, it's just this whole muddy thing now. Yeah. Okay. How can things possibly get any worse? Well, I'm going to tell you, kids. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. Oh, the, oh, the. This Disney. is honestly just as bad as the strike stuff, Dragon. It really yeah, is. Yeah. It's, okay. So the Disney Plus MCU behind the scenes chaos. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff's been said about this. I'm going to boil it down to just the, the key stuff, or at least my take on, on all this craziness. Cause some of it's been a little, some of it's been a little inaccurately reported. Some of it's at least been in the same ballpark. I've gotten some of it verified by Mark Bernardin, so like I, I, I got kind of a beeline on things here. The important parts to focus on here is that the MCU, the MCU, isn't doing great right now. And I feel well, I as I think I'm going to need a minute to take in that information. Okay, I'm good. The, okay, best. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. What I meant to say is the M- the MCU is in trouble. There you go. <laughs> but seriously, uh, I've said this before. I'm going to say it again because after all, after hearing all the, all this craziness, the best way I can sum it up is, guys, right now, immediate in the immediate space, not counting like down the line, we're eventually going to get like you know secret wars and everything. So not counting stuff we're going to have to wait years and years for. Um, right now, it feels like the immediate 
things that the MCU, their hopes and dreams really rest upon the shoulders of these two projects coming. It's Daredevil Born Again and Deadpool 3. Deadpool 3 is a lock. Daredevil Born Again is the other thing we got to talk about. Uh, yeah, Daredevil Born Again, not so much. Also, this... can I just say, like, really quick while we're on the subject of Marvel, mm -hmm. people need to shut the fuck up about the Marvels not doing well. Like, it's... Dragon, I, it's like, yeah, it's not going to do that well. It's like, yeah, the, the you know, it's, but like, I, I am so, I, like, I feel like people are just like, like, just fucking like, the, the, Dragon, they've got their knives out for that movie, man. And I, I, I'm i sick of it. I'm really think, sick of it. This is what I keep saying. Like, we got to let the movies come out first before. That's we what I'm just... saying, man. It's like, Dragon, people are just like, they are just like, I don't know. Anyways, go ahead. So my, my point is, so again, Deadpool 3 is a lock. We're all very excited for Deadpool 3. They're literally just waiting for them to get the green light to make Deadpool 3. That's all that's, that's lying on that one. That one's going to be, that one's at least going to be fun. At worst, in its worst case, it's at least going to be fun. Best case, it's going to be awesome and possibly dwarf, dwarf some of the other stuff. Who knows? It could be that good. No idea. But, uh, Daredevil, from what we understand, a lot's been reported on Daredevil, but specifically, they scra they they've essentially scrapped everything with Daredevil. They're going back to seemingly they're going back to square one with it because they shot eight episodes and then the strike happened and the reports were uh, the best. I guess the optimistic way of looking at it is their take. They now they have the writers back in the room. They've gotten like the writers room back together. They probably looked at what they had and they realized, yeah, we've uh, we may have made some mistakes here because the word on the street is the big mistake that they made was fogging camera either killed off or written out in the first episode and that's why they're mm. not on the show which is a very huge mistake my hope and we don't have all the details here obviously but the hope is they looked at that choice they saw okay we really can't do the show without these characters so we have to go back to square one which again you might think is like the worst worst thing in the world but you're looking at like okay yeah, if, if fog and karen are in the show and if we're gonna really i mean like I, I i i really like karen but all due respect to her i i, I kind of feel like there are other like you know, love interest that you could throw in. Um, but you, you absolutely cannot do a Daredevil show without Foggy Nelson. That, that, well, you that's see my point. Either thing. way, even even with that in mind, it's like just writing them out very casually, like episode one, in a way, like it seems like either killing him off or injuring him or doing something like that seems like a bad move, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So that's, a, that, that's the thing, which, I mean, already, if they don't show up, people are going to be upset. If they did him like that people be really it would be worse it would literally be worse than just writing them out yeah yeah so uh say so the word on the street is it's been it's they're going back to square one we the 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 problem that's been reported with a lot of the mcu shows that apparently behind the scenes that were now been illuminated to amidst all this chaos being reported is that they're uh they had no show either they had no showrunners or they've been switching out showrunners and putting on a happy face on all the all the behind the scenes documentaries that have been coming out. For example, mm -hmm. like She Hulk, She Hulk and Moon Knight, their original showrunners and and uh Secret Invasion. Mm -hmm. They have the original showrunners who bring the idea to the table and then uh then I th either they're leaving the project, Marvel's kind of like pressure them off the project or something like point me, the showrunners are leaving and they're taking a big back seat. And it's just being passed off to the next guy in the writers' room, which is why a lot of these shows presumably have had the weak finales. That's that's the that's the that's the theory that's going on right now with a lot of what's been happening, particularly She Hulk with a lot of the tonal shifts, and Secret Invasion being a big example. The guy who brought that idea to the table might have had some grandiose ideas, and then oh man, well, I mean, Secret Invasion was just. Like a hot mess through and through, but so they're trying to fix. It sounds like they're they've acknowledged, yeah, we have a showrunner problem. We haven't been like letting one guy like take it from start to finish, and we got to fix that. So they they found a new showrunner and they put the Loki directors on it just for a director. The, they have a the, he, the Loki directors are not the showrunners. Mm -hmm. uh, Dario um, Scardafni, he's the showrunner. He worked on the he worked on some of the Netflix stuff. Unfortunately, not the Netflix stuff I was hoping for. Uh. Here's the thing. It, I, it so it frustrates me a little bit. It's a step in the right direction, but it feels like we're so close to making a really good decision here. We have we have this guy who's a writer on a few Punisher episodes, but not the the best Punisher episodes from those from that show. Yeah, I mean, it's like you got to start somewhere, right? It's like, but yeah. yeah. I mean, here's the thing. I just T doesn't it feel like we should get Steven Zurich, the guy who did all the best episodes of Daredevil and all the, all the Marvel Netflix shows. He directed all these shows and did like the best episodes from all these shows. Why don't we get that guy to be the showrunner, right? Yeah, I don't know. 
Okay. Anyway, so all, all that said, just uh, the MCU always always felt like they needed to scale down the street level stuff um, and then incrementally build to something like Kang the Conqueror. So I don't know. So we're uh, you know Daredevil. I think it's going to be the make or break if we can get that pounded out and get that going right. Everything else should follow, but right now they got they got they got to get the ships right on this. There's just a lot of behind the scenes drama. They're just trying to sort out right now. I'm, I'm hoping they're going to figure it Dragon out. Dragon, if, okay. if I seem apathetic about this subject, it's just that you know, much like the whole, uh, uh, oh my god, the Marvels is going to flop. I feel like so many people have written such you know have done like sensationalized like clickbait about this drama and so it's really hard for me to kind of like determine like where the clickbait ends and where the real problems begin so frankly dragon i'm just i'm just really over like you know the whole the whole vibe of like disney is crashing but it's like i i know that disney is crashing and burning but i don't like i don't know but no, I, I, I hear you on that tk i'm not saying it's crashing and burning i'm saying it's on the precipice if they're not careful uh-huh yeah, okay. All right, so Dragon Ball, Diama. Uh, Dragon, tell me about this, because I, I really don't... Like, here's the thing. I'm not really caught up with Dragon Ball Super, or... Yeah, Dragon Ball Super, so I... Like, I don't know. I, I, I just don't really know all that much about this concept. Oh, this is very easy, Tiki. So, Dragon Ball Daima apparently translates to Dragon Ball Evil. Oh, jeez. That's what Daima, essentially, I guess that's what it means. That's what the translation is. Uh, so Toriyama, Kira Toriyama. Uh, basically, it's Toriyama-approved Dragon Ball GT. I'm not joking. Are you serious? It's oh essentially... God. Tiki, this is the premise. I don't know if you've seen, <laughs> seen, I don't know if you've seen any pictures of like of, of, the, of the footage or not. Uh-huh. Um, it wasn't the dubs. That's the thing. So I don't really know, Baron, what it's going to sound like. I've just, I've just seen, you know, like the uh, little trailer footage they put. They announced this at a, at a convention uh, uh, this month while you were gone. And basically, it's the premise of GT that as a kid, I was told and I scoffed at. And I was like, oh, son of a gun. It's 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 a real thing. We Apparently, we've turned all the Dragon Ball characters, though. All the characters have been de-aged to Kid Goku. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, God. And that means, like, Trunks and Goten are babies. Oh, God. That... But here's the thing. Toriyama. Toriyama. That's approved. the thing. So it's it's, it's like... Toriyama approved this time. It just seems like a very weird choice. It seems, yeah, I, I am not sure how I feel about that. I'm not sure all. how I feel about it either, Tiki. That's, that's the thing where it feels like... Really? He's going to come Baby back with Piccolo, another... Baby Piccolo, Dragon. Baby Piccolo. Well, no, it's Kid Piccolo. Okay, well, still. Yeah. Still, I mean, it feels... It feel, It just feels really odd. Like, really, we... You th- the whole... Everyone made such a big stink about Dragon Ball GT, and they're essentially taking the same... The same plot, roughly. Only we're not going as intergalactic with it, it seems. It seems to be... I mean, the, much... Do you know if it has, like, the same like super dumb setup that gt had with the peel off thing i well here <laughs> that's see, that's the thing okay so in super i don't know if you recall any of the super that you have seen we have like Kid dragon I, with super i've only seen two of the movies that's it i only well, saw battle saying, of the I, gods and then the the dragon ball super superheroes that, that, that's that's my exposure to super i really haven't seen anything else okay my point is i think even in the movies they might have worked this in there maybe they didn't essentially they have kid peel off kid my and kid shoe oh yes. yeah no they did they did so yeah, based yeah. on so that makes me wonder if are we going to connect that to this oh like my is God. that because they remember Tiki, in well this thing in super they never explain why they're kids but That's you're right. Thing. You're right. Yeah, they never <laughs> explain it, so it's almost like a barb at GT. But now we're doing a whole show based on. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Jesus Christ! I mean, maybe I. I don't. I don't expect it to be great, but I mean, maybe. Maybe it'll be good. I, I, the big question. I have one singular question with it. Honestly, are we going to have Kid Goku's voice coming mm. back, or is it going to be Sean Schimmel, but just in, mm. Go- in Tiny Goku body? Yeah, we'll see. That's that right. is a good question. All right, uh, let's see. Moving on. Uh, crazy story, kind of an uplifting story, but also yeah. A this isn't really story. news per se. It's just kind of like a feel good story, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Matthew Vaughn. Uh, he was at a convention, I think, or he's doing some some event, and he was asked questions, and he revealed uh, that originally he was in talks to direct X three. He didn't direct X three, which is crazy very... to think about because that was yeah. like a long time before first class. 
Yeah, so this is probably, I imagine what happened was this is when Singer like went on to do Superman Returns and they were looking for a guy to fill uh -huh. the chair. And uh, so Matthew Vaughn was probably in talks for all before they got Ratner, because I think Ratner was probably the next guy in, in line, because I think... Isn't it crazy that Ratner and Singer turned out to both be pieces of shit? I mean, ultimately, yeah, it's kind of... <laughs> like, uh, so that's the thing, if, if memory serves... I want to say what happened was it was literal, a literal switcheroo at the end of the day, where Ratner was actually in, in talks in the Superman movie, and then it swapped with, with Singer somehow. I think that's... Uh -huh. I heard that somewhere. The point being, Matthew Vaughn's calling in, like, in between that choice there. And Vaughn's brought in, he's, he's, he's very seriously about to direct the movie, and he's, uh, he's looking over things. Like, he finds this big old script on a table, and he flips through, he says, like, and, like, I guess one of the producers in the room or something says, like, oh, no, you don't want to, uh, you, you don't need to flip through. I'm going to direct this movie. Of course I'm going to flip through the script. What are you nuts? And he's flipping <laughs> through the script. And he, he, like, I guess the opening of the movie says, uh, you know, storms in Africa, and she's, like, bringing rain to, like, dehydrated and starving children in Africa. You like, see, that's, you, that sounds like a fucking yeah. awesome premise for a storm story, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. That's exactly. <laughs> that, that's something she does in the comics. That's very verbatim. That's uh -huh. very on brand with her. It's like, that's, that, honestly, as an opening for an next movie, if we're going to check in with, like, maybe they're scattered around the globe and they're doing stuff. Right, right, and right. And back together. That's a pretty good opener. And Matthew Mall's like, hey, this sounds really good. Uh, why didn't you want me to read this? Well, that's Holly Berry's. That, that's the script we're going to give oh, uh, Holly, Holly, Holly Berry. She's like, well, wait, what do you mean? She's like, yeah, we're going to we're gonna show this to her so she'll sign on for the movie. And that's going to go right in the right in the trash can. Just what the fuck is wrong with Hollywood in the 2000s, man? That's all I can say. And that's in that I moment... In that moment, uh, Matthew Vaughn said, "Well, I'm not. I'm not directing that because you're going to treat your stars like, a, like an Oscar winner, like Holly Berry, like that. Yeah, I'm not going to do this movie good for him. So what's that? It makes doesn't make you like Matthew Vaughn even more? Yeah, I mean, you know, I I'm not like the biggest Matthew Vaughn fan as far as like his actual filmmaking. I think he's a little style over substance for my taste. But yeah, I mean, he's always seemed like a really chill guy at least. So he's yeah, got integrity. You got to respect that. You know? uh -huh. Okay." Yep. All right. Um, Kogia says X3 is an underrated film. That's Man, a take. It has its <laughs> moments. Look, look, X3 has its moments. It right? has its moments, sure. It has its moments. Like you can say about most films, especially when you're looking for something good to say, X3 does have its moments. <laughs> you know? I will say X3 is definitely not my least favorite X-Men movie. Right. So that's I mean, Professor X's like. death is very impactful in that film. You know, sure, it's a, sure. It's a good scene. You know? I like the angel stuff in X Men. Yeah. For the most part. That was well, it was well realized. Yeah. Uh huh. All right. Okay, let's see. And then we just have some trailers to go over. So, mm -hmm. Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, Dragon. I don't know about you, but I think this looks pretty damn cool. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's going to surpass what Matt Reeves did, but it does look really good. I mean, obviously, we're we're losing Matt Reeves. We're also losing Andy Serkis. That's you know, th th that's two big names off the off the table. Uh, but are we sure Andy Serkis isn't playing the characters like just under different like? I'm pretty sure it's not Andy Serkis. Yes, I'm pretty sure. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, and, like if this is like, I really do like the idea of potentially starting a new trilogy that kind of like blends into the original planet of the ape story mm -hmm. um so dragon if they really pull this off this could be like the first you know like six part saga where all the films are just rock solid you know what i mean i mean basically it would be like the idealized star wars <laughs> that's what i'm saying exactly exactly you have three trilogies <laughs> I'm sorry, not sorry, not well. Act well. That's I don't know. Then you have to factor. Well, the ori movie. the original is. Uh, yeah. I think there were like four or five. That's of that's them. the thing because I really I was going to say trilogy. I was like, well, well, yeah, the original films were more than three. So, but uh, but yeah, uh, I mean the just the visuals alone, uh, the the hawk. Um, I I don't know. I I'm just really looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. Next we have. Full guy. Yeah, so this uh, this definitely looks like a a fun time for sure. Um, Ryan Gosling playing a stunt man. He's kind of going back to his driver roots with that. Mm -hmm. um, definitely looks like uh, some interesting stylization here. Dragon, remind me what David Leach has done. Well, David, 
Well, okay, David Leach, he uh, he started as the uh, as the co-director of, of the first John Wick. Oh, right. Okay. He's he then John did, Wick guy, okay. He then did Deadpool 2 and then he did Bullet Train. Oh, Bullet Train. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There this we is go. him kind of so the idea is like a Bullet Train vibe. So that's essentially sure. that's that's the sense I'm getting that he's kind of doing movies like Bullet Train, which is like we're taking kind of like a popular action putting in a very unique kind of action situation. You know what? I actually kind of feel like his style is similar to Matt Reeves, but for me, a little bit more palatable because it's less in your face. Well, it's also kind of like uh, the core story is very boiled down to something simple. That's the other thing, too, what you know, Leach has in his corner. Okay, we got sure, a guy on a sure. train trying to get a case. That's all he's trying to do. <laughs> right, right. In this case, we have a stunt. If I have it right, the stunt man's trying to save someone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But yeah, this looks good. I mean, I, I'm so I really love Bullet Train. I love that uh, uh, David Leach. I really like his style. I like what he did on Deadpool too. So this guy has this guy honestly has he's earned my respect and he has my business. Frankly, I really like David Leach what he's done. I think uh, I'm not as sold on this as I am Bullet Train, but I, I like it. I like what I've seen of it. I'm I'm sold on seeing it. Sure, sure. All right, and finally we have Echo, a show yeah. that frankly I have been talking a lot of shit about mm-hmm. since it was announced. Constantly. And Dragon, uh, Chris R. Notarelli put out a post, and he he's optimistic about it, but he says that the trailer kind of proves that it should have just been a kingpin show. And honestly, I can't agree with him more. Echo can still be a big focus of it, but. Uh, that dragon what i can say about this trailer is that it is very well edited mm-hmm. with the uh you know like the sound of the grunts and everything yeah and, um but i am part of me is definitely like has has a little bit of low-key paranoia where it's like okay but are we gonna pull a bait and switch where it's like we get a little bit of kingpin in the beginning we get some kingpin at the end, but then a lot of the show is just Echo on her own. Like, I, I truly hope not, Dragon. I truly hope that kingpin is, like, as much of a focal point as she is in the show. I mean, look, I've, obviously we don't, we, I, I don't know with 100% certainty here, but it really does feel like if the show knows what it's doing, it's going to be, she's trying to get revenge on the kingpin or vice versa, so they're going to be in each other's crosshairs for the whole season, which would make the most sense, which would be the most dramatically interesting. I mean, basically, hopefully they learn their lesson from Hawkeye, right? That's all we can really hope for. Yeah, now, there's a couple interesting things with the Echo. One, I think it's very, I agree with you full heartedly. It's a very well edited, really well put together trailer. Of course, D'Onofrio Kingpin that makes me, it's 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 my color of happiness, D'Onofrio And I don't, I, and frankly, I don't necessarily think that, I mean, it was cool to see him in Hawkeye, but I don't really think that he was, like, in full form in Hawkeye, whereas here, right from the get-go, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, yeah, we are we are getting Netflix Daredevil Kingpin here. You know yeah. what I mean? I mean, y- yes. Uh, admittedly, there was one thing that did kind of... Two things jumped out of me here. Um, one, there's kind of a light confirmation here that... Uh, I, it's a... Wait. Sorry, I'm trying to, trying to see how I can best phrase this here. Okay. So, we see the Kingpin in the flashback in the awesome looking kingpin outfit now technically that doesn't line up with the netflix stuff and that's not not that is that quite an issue but it seems to me maybe a confirmation unless they just like threw caution the winds you know what we don't care it's like a we don't care moment like let's just put him in the outfit even though he shouldn't have that outfit yet dragon honestly i i kind of feel like they really need to just have that attitude about um the netflix stuff because frankly i feel like if they don't have a we don't care attitude then they're gonna be stuck kind of like you know trying to jump through hoops to try and maintain all the continuity well i, I, well, I know here's here's why I, I bring it up for this reason tiki okay in hawkeye they had these deleted scenes but basically the version of hawkeye that would have had more kingpin like shown from the outset that's already heard about it you know they can find the clips online where you see okay kingpin interacting with her as a kid and him interacting with her mother. And in those flashbacks, he's wearing the black suit like he did in the Netflix show. Now those were deleted scenes. And it's like, he's saying, let's go get some ice cream. And this trailer is, Hey, taking her to get some ice cream. And he beats up the ice cream vendor. That was really mean to her. (laughs) So it feels like that. Okay. feels like, okay. The, the, the scenes that were deleted from Hawkeye didn't happen. This is our reimagining of those scenes. 
So that's that's uh-huh. the only reason I, I bring it. That's what it feels like. So it's I I can't really tell at this juncture if it's just going to be like okay we're just going to it'll be like the loose continuity thing that we're kind of going for, or it's like we're we are going to try and put as much Netflix in there as we can, but we're just going to maybe fudge a few details, which is not the end of the world. But I just I guess everyone is kind of looking for a straight answer, like if it happened or or not. And this is like a thing where it looks like it's a not. But then again, it could just be, yeah, we want a cool wardrobe on them. You know, we don't know. <laughs> we just don't know. But it's awesome. <laughs> right. And it looks like the reason like, I think it's like the answer is why is he in the white suit? Because it looks cool with the blood. That's why he's in the white suit. That's the only reason yeah. he's in yeah. the white <laughs> But that's the thing. It's, it's cool, though, and I, I like it. It's just now, you know, you know what would be a major, like, slap in the face to the continuity dragon is what? if they totally just, like, rework the rabbit in the, sto- in the snowstorm stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? If they just yeah, like had like a totally different like uh, interpretation of all that stuff, I think the sh- the show should begin with him just having a rabbit in a snowstorm or something like that, or just not even acknowledge it if they don't want to tie back. To that. Yeah, that's I the think. thing because we we gave him those ca- the, those uh, couple. I'm just saying the rabbit in the snowstorm stuff is probably the most iconic character writing that they do with him. So it would be it would be hard to walk some of that stuff back. You know what I mean? I guess all I'm saying, Tiki, is that we have all these great nuggets from the netflix show but we just haven't said like we haven't like officially 100 percent confirmed anything it's been so much so much time has passed they don't even know if vanessa's gonna be here right well they re they recast vanessa because they the actress had a prior but with all the strike business and the fact they're starting Uh, from zero i don't know if they're going to change that and try and get the original actress back i have no idea Okay, fair enough. But, but my point <laughs> is, like, we've had, like, in Hawkeye, we gave him the, the cufflinks that were from the Netflix show. So that's what I'm saying. It's Rabbit in a Snowstorm being included, like, in the background. It would make sense. Right, right, right. But then you have I'm to saying, say, like, what you don't want to do is you don't want to just, like, totally remake the Rabbit in the Snowstorm origin. Yeah, exactly. You don't want to precisely. Yeah. So anyway, the other thing, and here's the one that gripe I, I love all the Tiki. I do, and I, I'm so looking forward to that. Going to pretty, it's like a vindication moment for me. It's like, man, look how impressive and it's going to be TVMA, like it should be. It's going to look at all that. It looks great. The one hesitation I have, it, it's just a nitpick, but it's like, why couldn't we have shot the kingpin in both eyes? Why just the one eye? Eh. I'm just saying know. it's. It's like the whole irony of like he's blinded, it's just one eye. This, you know, <laughs> I got nothing there. I, I just, it's a quibble, but it's just like it's like it feels like why shoot him in the eye, period, if we can't shoot him in both, right? Anyway, point, but you're it, it looks good though, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, like I said, Dragon, I have been shitting on just the very concept of this show since it was announced, yeah. so. Uh, on that level, this this trailer does the job of what a trailer should do, mm-hmm. which is to actually get me interested in watching it. Yep. All right. All right. Uh, Code Geass says, uh, <laughs> now that Disney can use Daredevil, I want Bullseye to ride on Bullseye the horse from Toy Story. Good. <laughs> uh, now Kingpin and Nick Fury can be eye patch buddies. That's the other thing too. Where if Kingpin is blind in both eyes, you know eventually he's going to get his sight back. But still, it's like now it's like, will he always have an eye patch? Now is it like, you know, how does this work? All right. Well, let's uh, let's dive right into October twenty twenty three movies. Uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, Dragon. I'm assuming you did get a chance to see this. Yes. All right. Well, I will let you start. What did you think? Yes, so of course this is uh, Scorsese's Apple TV Plus film that was uh, ba- it's based on a book which is based essentially is this book came out in 2017 essentially doing kind of like what Watchmen did like talking about a story akin to the the, Tol- the the Tulsa Black Wall Street event only with the Native American community. So it is based on a real event. A lot of this is based in real life, but someone just wrote a book about it and that 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 summation of events has been turned to a movie. Um, yeah, so this uh, I. I liked it. I really, I really liked this. I thought it was, um, I thought it was good. Uh, I don't know if I like it as much as. Um, it's kind of hard to say where I, where this one lands on in between, like this and the uh, the Irishman. I did like the Irishman. Irishman. For me, I'd probably put the Irishman above this. I, I like this too, but. That's the thing. I mean, I I respect that Scorsese. I, I was really going to this movie wondering. I always I just heard it was based on a book and the the, the whole. 
I didn't know if Scorsese was going to put his style in this as much. And when I watched me, oh yeah, this is a Scorsese movie through and through. Look at this. It's well, what's basically- interesting about that is like w- when I first heard the premise, I was kind of thinking it'd be something more like uh, the uh, the the movie he did with Adam Driver and Andrew Garfield, which very much did not feel like a Scorsese movie. So yeah, no, you're right. It, it, this definitely has the makings of Scorsese for sure. Right. Wait, what movie are you talking about? Um, I, I forget the name. It's like a one word title. Let me look it up. I don't, say, I don't think he ever did a movie with Adam Driver and Andrew Garfield, but I'm. Am I? Am I? That's a thing. Okay, well, anyways. Um... Okay, okay. The point being, yeah, I was I was curious how he was going to approach this, but I mean, it kind of clicked for me in theory. Like, okay, it's basically Scorsese doing a, you know, doing a Western with a really interesting kind of hook. That's essentially what this movie is. I mean, I know it's set in the 20s, but it's, it, it kind of has like a lot of elements like a Western in it. It's like a Western mixed with a mob movie, which is like perfect yeah. for Scorsese. Yeah, so basically the premise of the film, for those who may not be aware, you know, the Osage people, they, uh, you know, the, the, this Native American, uh, you know, kind of, a, Native Americans essentially local to Oklahoma, they struck oil and they had the rights to that land, and it's this, it's this really twisted, awesome premise of basically white people tried to get their hands on, on the money, and uh, by and the money the Native American people had with the, because they found the oil, by overcharging them and marrying into their families and stealing their fortunes, which is really sick and twisted the way we do it in this movie. It's like this conspiracy to kill the Osage families, uh, you know, and inherit their fortunes, but like in like in legal standing, in a really underhanded way. Okay, uh, Dragon, really quick, I did look it up. It's called Silence. Uh, it is Andrew Garfield and Adam Driver. It was just uh, not a lot of people talked about it because... Uh, like I said, it, it did not feel like a Scorsese movie. It did not have the same sort of vibe and energy. Okay. So. Anyway. Okay. Um, oh, Colby yeah, man. What... says, um, I went to go see this with my friend who's indigenous, and it was the single most emotional experience I've had in a movie all year. Yeah, that does sound... That, that, that would be pretty emotional. Um, I, I, I'll be honest with you, because of the, us being in our generation here, I mean, I can't speak for you with this silence movie, but I mean, for me at least, I have not, I've never really seen a Scorsese movie in theaters. This is a first for me. Oh, have I seen Scorsese in theaters? Oh, man, I'd have to think about that. Well, definitely Wolf of Wall Street. Definitely Wolf there of Wall Street. There you go. Yeah, okay, so there you go. You at least had, you had that then. I did not. Have um, that. I don't, honestly, I don't <laughs> think anything else. Let me go back and... I because I, I didn't see Hugo in theaters. Yeah, that would have been. That was like a big like three D thing. Mm-hmm. Um. Anyways, uh, so for me, Dragon, I think I like the first half of the. I love the first half mm-hmm. of this movie, and the second half, I respect more than I actually fully engage with. If that makes sense. Okay. Um. Just because. I feel like here's the thing. I, I oh, and the Aviator. I also saw in theaters. Lucky, very Just lucky. That. Yeah, um, I, I was too young to fully appreciate that one though. When I saw it, yeah, it would feel like an odd choice to take a kid to see the Aviator. I was like 13, 14, so it was like I, I wanted to see it on my own accord just because it looked interesting. But hmm. uh, anyways, uh, so for me, Dragon. I think all the all the hook of this movie, all the driving momentum, kind of begins and ends with De Niro. I think this is easily one of the best modern day De Niro performances, and probably one of the best De Niro performances of all time. I mean, age eighty, and, he's delivering this. It's it's impressive. And I just I, like I will say like I, I definitely think that uh, I like The Irishman better as an overall film, just because I think it has a lot more momentum. I like the. Uh, the payoffs in the second act a lot more, but I honestly, as far as a De Niro performance goes, he was good in the Irishman, but I think out of the three leads in the Irishman, his performance was definitely the, the, the least flashy. And here it's like, I, I mean, God damn, he is like, it's chilling. You know, yeah, it really is. he's it really he's is. so folksy and well, he's practically the unofficial mayor of the town. Mm-hmm. And, and he, he can be like with a I smile. I feel like he's like head. a definitive like wolf in sheep's clothing film character, which is the whole point of the whole wolves in sheep's clothing thing. It's the whole aspect of the movie there, with like the sure. what's in the book that he reads from the start. You know, I mean, wolves do you see in this picture? That's sort of yeah. 
So, unfortunately, Dragon, my issue with this movie is that as we get into the second half, I kind of feel like like it, it gets just a little bit like repetitive where I, I feel like we're kind of just like hitting the same beats over and over again where it's like, yeah, isn't this fucked up? What's happening to these people? I'm like, yeah, it is. It is most definitely fucked up. But like I, basically, Dragon, I don't necessarily I really don't think this needed to be three and a half hours. That, yeah, that's I have with it. I mean, I was compelling though, I was sitting there and watching. You got wrapped up in it, but you're right though. In retrospect, you know, maybe three. And in a half. the second half, I definitely think the most compelling stuff is the stuff with Leo, you know, poisoning his wife. And See, that's um, what was I, interesting—the fact that he loves you buy the love story there, and you know, right, he loves right. her, and he's like, just, you know, it's like it's so that was interesting—the fact that he loves her, but he's doing this terrible thing to her. But that, I, that honestly, make I kind of feel like that should have been like even more zeroed in on in the second half than it was if that makes sense because there's a lot of other like moving parts like for example jesse plemons gets brought in in the second half and dragon usually i love my jesse plemons but i i don't know for some reason i just didn't really i, I didn't really feel like his character added all that much i mean obviously like as a character he's important to the story but uh uh and then, you know, you have, like, people like Brendan Fraser, and again, it's like, it's great to see him pop up. It's, you know, it's wonderful to see Brendan Fraser getting work again, but I feel like all these characters kind of pop up in the second half, and it kind of makes the second half a lot more unfocused. Does that make sense? Well, I mean, honestly, when we have, like, the loops during the trial, that's kind of like the parts of, like, you know, we're starting the trial, and then, like, this man is my client, you know, we, gotta, we I have to confer with my I'll client. say this much, I'll say this much. I think... Oppenheimer handled the third act being the big court case stuff way better than this movie did. I'll say that much. Like I was, I was super compelled by the court stuff in Oppenheimer in a way that I just wasn't here. Sure. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, the, the central themes are very strong. De Niro's perfect. And I got to tell you, man, my, uh, my grandfather, he loved, Scorsese films. He loved them with a capital. I was, I gotta be honest. I knew this. I initially thought this was going to be released on Apple TV plus directly, or at uh -huh. the very least within like the same month. I didn't, uh, so point being this, apparently I, I, it sounds like it's going to be like probably streaming like the top of next year. Cause they have to do the Oscar thing where they wanted to get the Oscars. So they got put it in theaters for like two months or whatever, however long. I mean, the Irishman was in theaters for like, what like a couple weeks I that's think? the thing so however they i don't uh, know i think it's, it's it's somewhere between they want to qualify for the oscars and they probably oh i did see the irishman in theaters now that i think about it well there you go <laughs> okay um my point is i a part of me again while the main focus was on him seeing oppenheimer a part of me was hoping uh that i'd be able to show him you know this but this uh -huh. from the comfort of home versus like you know a three and a half hour movie versus the three or already pushing it for the three hour movie with oppenheimer. No, that's the thing though i really do feel like that extra half hour you feel it man you really do yeah so all i can say is like i really think uh you know as someone who adored both, he adored Scorsese, and he really loved De Niro. Um, I think he would have loved this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he never would have sat in the theater for it, but he would have loved this. this. Thing, it's like I definitely want to watch it again just to see if, just to see if the parts click in place for me a little bit more in the second half because it it definitely did in Oppenheimer, as you know, with with Oppenheimer for me the second time I saw it, stuff like really clicked into place, but. It's a long sit, man. Yeah. And <laughs> so, it is. That it is. So we'll see. All right. All right. Uh, okay. So let's see. Uh, next up, Old Dads. Why don't you take the lead on this again, Dragon? This was definitely like, I, I watched it. I enjoyed it. But it's much more like you're, you were the big proponent for this one. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, this is kind of the equivalent to what Burt Kreischer did with the machine. This essentially is Bill Burr's. Uh, you know, the, you know, we have our Netflix comedian essentially getting their their uh, you know their their essentially their Netflix movie that essentially econ that economizes their uh, their their whole stand up and their whole kind of life story through stand up into a movie. 
it it has it's very much uh, Bill Burr's uh, you know it's, it's pretty much everything he's talking about stand up, but also it's kind of like F is for it has a a big F is for family. Vibe. Very much feels like live action F is for family, except without the period piece. Angle. Well, that's the thing. It's made, what if F is for family was in the modern day? Right, and right. Turned out some of like the weird stuff I didn't like from F is for family. So in that respect. <laughs> In that respect, I really, I really enjoyed it, and that's. I thought, I, I thought it was very funny. Uh, you know, some people, admittedly, some people. I think this is really funny. I think it's more of a benchmark success for the movie than anything else. Some people are making a stink about it, uh, which to me says it's working. That's the whole thing. They're making fun of the PC generation in the film, and like the people that are like, you know, saying like. Uh, you know, really criticizing certain things like, you know, folks, we don't have conflict if people aren't politically incorrect in the movie or at the very least failing miserably at trying to be politically correct in the movie. The thing I really liked about it is it has like a Curb Your Enthusiasm. It's like a Boston. It's like, what if Curb Your Enthusiasm were set in Boston? Kind of. Uh -huh. That's what it feels like. <laughs> yeah, I this was an airplane movie for me, and it, that's more or less what it is. I, I thought it was uh, I thought it was fun. Um. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, you got some good Bill Burr rants in there and yeah, exactly. also Bobby Cannavale having a good time. Uh, it's just uh, the, the, like with this, like this movie, just dragging this movie is very much like swimming in like it, it very much feels like a Netflix movie in style. I mean, it and what I mean by that is that it it has no style, frankly. It's a very dull looking TV movie kind of vibe going on here. Um yeah but it's not shooting for the moon. They're they're not No, I know it. it's not shooting for the moon, but it just I don't know. I it's just going basically for basically dragging the way to sum up my thoughts on this thing is like I, I had a good time while I was watching it. It you know it filled up the time of a flight. I'm never gonna think about it again for the rest of my life. But like really not even like is is maybe like well if you need to sum up Bill Burr like really not no uh, I think Bill Burr, uh, I, well, here, I, I just think that his actual stand-up is, like, so much more impactful. That's the thing. It kind of feels like it's, like, taking, like, elements of his stand-up, but it's very sanitized versions of his stand-up, if that makes sense. So I, I don't know, man. I you know it is what it is. I mean, like you 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 said it yourself. This movie's definitely not shooting for the moon. So it's like I can't say I didn't enjoy my time watching it. But it's I feel like it's a very disposable film. So I'm sorry. All right, um, Kogia says I'm bothered by the old dad's poster. They build the actors in the wrong order. Yeah, that a lot of a lot of movies do that. A lot of posters do that. I drag him. I'm sorry. I didn't fucking like old dads as much as you. You're giving me the silent treatment. Oh, okay. And he was actually, uh, <laughs> looks like he was having some technical difficulties. So I apologize for that folks. I was like, I was like, what do you want me to say dragon? I didn't love old dads. What the hell do you want from me? <laughs> so, all right. Well, let's see here, folks. Let me see. I know for a fact that Dragon is not going to care all that much about the movie when evil lurks. He might care if friendship ended over old dads. I know, right? I, dude, I literally thought he was giving me the silent treatment. I literally thought it was like, oh, he thinks old dad is dis old dads is disposable? The nerve of him. <laughs> okay, so... Colby, actually, I'm glad that you're in the chat here, because I am going to talk about when evil lurks. Or not. I will talk about Five Nights at Freddy's, because he's back. Yep. You there? Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, I, Dragon, I literally thought you were giving me the silent treatments over me being silent. No, no, no. Tiki, they, they, no, te technical difficulties, Tiki. Uh, <laughs> so the last thing I heard is that you probably... They, I was looking for like a, another Bill Burr summation example. Did you have something you... Like, what did you say? I mean, like I said, Dragon, it's, you know, it, it's a it's a decent enough time, but I just think, like, the uh, his stand-up is just, like, so, his stand-up just has a lot more teeth and is a lot more memorable than anything in this movie for me. Well, look, I, look, I, I agree. It's the plot's not Yates, but it's just, I just, I just like the, the Bill It doesn't thing. have a plot. Yeah. That's the thing. It is very much a comedy that is just a sequence of events that just kind of happens. 
All right, fair enough. I'm still, I, I don't, I kind of, it's like a good time, not like, it's kind of like a good time, don't overthink it sort of vibe, you know, just sort yeah. of like, you know, like look, look at, look at Bill Burgo and kind of this at least produced sequence of events. Almost if a stand up special could have like, you know, like the illusion of a movie, like the Kevin Hart movie, stand up special movies, you know? Kokia says, now I want an old dad's review where Dragon and Tiki debate over the quality of the film. Yeah, I mean, like I said, it's like I, I watched on an airplane. I had a couple good chuckles in it. That, that's about all I'm ever going to think about this movie. I don't no, know. No, I just love yeah. that he's, he's angry, he's got a temper, but he's a loving dad. Like that's, uh-huh. like that's the dichotomy that sells me. This guy really does care about his kid, but he's just so darn angry about everything. And again, it's that Kirby enthusiasm thing where I agree with most of his points here. Sure, <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> It's like he's not rolling the vaping gag. It's like the thing about things. like the, the 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 writing him up for being like what like two minutes late. Yeah. That was ridiculous. Well, oh, fun fact: that lady, uh, she's from Lucifer, by the way. She's like a right, she's a big part in Lucifer, so she's uh, it's kind of fun uh-huh. seeing her being being yelled at like that. Okay, uh, we got little blue in the comments. He says uh, October is usually the the one month where there's no big movies, but I feel like there were some for this October. There are a couple. Um, we will talk about one big movie off the bat right here. We'll talk about Five Nights at Freddy's, Dragon. Dragon, do you know about The Bite of 86? The what? The Bite of 86. I'm, I'm, I'm totally just fucking kidding. <laughs> it's, it's deep cut Five Nights at Freddy's lore, Dragon. Don't worry about it. Hmm. Okay, so Dragon, I actually... Here's the thing about Five Nights at Freddy's. Um... I kind of feel the same way about this movie that you feel about old dads, where it's like, I, like I, I have a lot of respect for it in spite of the fact that it's clearly not aiming for the moon in any way, shape, or form. Um, did you know that the Jim Henson Company did the animatronics? Wait, get out of here! They, I'm not kidding. They, really? They for this? I'm not story? kidding. Yeah. Huh. And Dragon, they are all practical, and I tell you what, man, they are the reason to check this movie out. And I will also say, Dragon, that I, if you can sit through The Exorcist, right, you're going to be fucking fine in this movie. This movie is not scary at all, definitively. Like, you will be fine, Dragon. Watch this movie, check out some cool Jim Henson animatronics, um... Like Keeper Colby says, it is literally the only reason to see the movie. But I think it's a pretty valid reason, honestly. Um, Because it's just really cool to see something that Hollywood could very easily just be like, yeah, let's just make them CGI. But no, it's like every shot that you see the animatronics, you clearly see they are fully formed practical things. And they look awesome, Dragon. They really do. Uh, the movie itself is like it's it's very much just okay. It's very much just okay. Like I feel like the uh, the plot, the writing, they were very much trying to appease the uh, the hardcore fans, which might have been a mistake. I think they tried to squeeze too much lore from the games into this. Essentially, Dragon, they pulled off like a much less egregious version of uh, the M Night Shyamalan. Uh, last airbender movie because essentially the problem here is that they're squeezing like three or four games worth of lore into one movie and that's that's definitely the problem um there's just too much going on the plot is frankly way too complicated for a movie that should be very very streamlined like i very much wish this was just you know the security guard in the office trying to avoid the animatronics, but there's a lot of other like extra shit that goes down, frankly, that I don't have the time or energy to explain. Um, we don't get that many practical effects in films. Uh, so thank God the five, five minutes, Freddy's animatronics to be practical. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, so dragon, like I said, it's like, Oh, and also Matthew Lillard dragon. He doesn't have much screen time, but he has a very memorable role in this. So, See it for Matthew Lillard. See it for the Jim Henson animatronics. I guarantee you, you are not going to lose any sleep with the horror with the horror elements of this at all. So yeah, um, let's see. Keeper Colby says the most Five Nights at Freddy's I've consumed is from uh, babysitting my little cousin, hearing Matt Pat in the background say words I don't understand. This movie may be for fans, but it wasn't for me. Yeah, and, and like I said, Colby, it's you know. He, 
like I am such a fan of the Jim Henson company that I am willing to give this a recommendation just based on that. But obviously, like the actual <laughs> mechanics of the plot are not that great. It really, they really aren't. Wait, let me ask you: um, but, are, they uh, like, are they suit puppets or are they actual like? They're actual animatronics, as far as I can. I'm sure it's probably a little bit of a combination of the two. Dragon, I'm sure there is some suit work involved. Uh, but no, there a lot of times it is actual animatronics. And I will say the set of the actual the actual pizzeria set is amazing. And it, it, it brings me right back to the 90s, man. It's it's a like I, I love the set in this movie. So hmm. oh, so yeah. Also, uh Matt Pat had a cameo and the audience went freaking nuts. <laughs> and that was that was pretty cool to see. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Okay, so let's see, Dragon. You've got uh, The Burial. Yeah, this is a movie I recommend to you, Tiki. Uh, okay. This, this is an Amazon biopic. It's uh, based on this article about this uh, this really interesting trial. Um, so Jamie Foxx, it's it's Jamie Foxx and Tommy Lee Jones. Uh, Alan Ruck uh, is also in this from Succession. Mm-hmm. Also, uh, uh, Wade from uh, Wade from Elemental. Uh, um, Budo, uh, uh, he, uh, he, he's in this, a uh, he. Um, those are the kind of main four guys in the movie. Point being, in real life, uh, O'Keefe's funeral homes, it's like a nationwide sort of like, you know, kind of funeral kind of thing. Uh, they're everywhere. Um, basically, these guys actually care about the families and everything that they're, you know, they're doing the funeral services for. Um, uh, Tommy Lee Jones, he's he's Mr. O, he's Jeremiah O'Keefe. He's the guy who runs it. He's, he's an old, he's an aged man in this. He's, uh, you know, he's a very Southern, humble guy. Um, and he's basically in a David and Goliath legal situation with this guy who basically bought some steak uh, in the funeral homes. He, he, and he went into a deal with him. And essentially, uh, this guy is basically like he's, he's, he's stalling out on the deal. So he'll bankrupt him and he'll just take all, all of his assets, which is a real scummy thing to do. You know, he's going to basically bankrupt until he makes a deal. So um, basically, we, uh, we we turn to a very unconventional lawyer to bail him out of the situation. So again, he goes to a, a guy who's usually like a personal injury lawyer instead of like a contract lawyer, which is what he needs right now. So he goes for essentially Jamie Foxx playing a Saul Goodman type. It's imagine, if Saul, imagine if you splice together Saul Goodman and Johnny Cochran. That's Jamie oh, Foxx in this movie, so he's a delight. He uh, he plays a very flashy, very Saul Goodman esque kind of personal injury lawyer who is essentially charmed into, like, hey, take this case. But uh, he may he's doing it so he can turn like the very humble. I just want six million dollars to turn like a six hundred million dollar case. You know, he wants to Willie Gray. He wants to take him to the cleaners in in, in a big way. It's, and this again, this is like a very Saul Goodman type of guy. Usually settled. He constantly settles. But this is a case where they cannot settle. Sure. You know, so it's um, so I mean, the only issue I really have, it's a little long, you know, it's um, it's a little long, but it, I think it gets to it, it gets into a groove in the movie where there's a nice build up to like once you it, once you get hooked in, it's like, oh, God, I got to see how this thing ends. <laughs> you know, there's some twist, uh, some turns, especially with the Alan Ruck character. Uh, Bill Camp, he play he Bill Camp plays essentially he's the Goliath in the David Goliath situation. He's the guy that kind of messes with poor uh, Tommy Lee Jones in this film. And I tell you, man, Bill Camp, he's got a scene in this movie when uh, he's got two scenes towards the end of the movie, during the two big moments of the movie at, towards the end that are just really like wow worthy. Like man, he's playing such a dirt bag here. It's amazing what he's doing. It's a good, it's a really good scene. Uh-huh. But I don't, I, I'd recommend it to you. It's on Amazon. So, you know, it'd probably be if you need, like, so, yeah, I guess maybe a comfort watch, I guess. Okay. Oh. All right. Well, um, the next movie that I'm going to be talking about, Dragon, is very much the opposite of a comfort watch. We're talking When Evil Lurks. This is an Argentinian horror movie and. It's pretty hardcore. It's pretty hardcore, Dragon. There is some, uh, there's some grisly, grisly shit that goes down in this movie. Um, what I really like about this, though, uh, I think I think the closest comparison I can have for this movie is is it kind of feels like how Twenty Eight Days Later, you know, like was kind of like a reinvention of the zombie genre. This feels like a reinvention of the 
demonic possession genre. This very much has that vibe of like, we are taking the concept of demonic possession, but we are changing up the rules, changing up the formula, changing up the, the lore. Um, and there's a bunch of different stuff that they twist around with it. I like that this movie kind of takes place in a universe where demonic possessions are just kind of a thing that's accepted and people just kind of deal with them in a realistic kind of utilitarian sort of way. Like there's, there's people that deal with them. They're not, they're not priests. They're just, and it's not necessarily exorcists. It's just uh, more so specialized doctors. Um, And so this movie has some really interesting world building to it. But again, it's brutal dragon. The way that they depict demonic possession in this movie is essentially that uh, demonic spirits enter the person's body and essentially swell them to like really gross, like bulbous, pussy Cronenberg monstrosities dragon. I mean, the body horror in this movie is intense. I will say that much. Um, and also, weirdly enough, Dragon, this movie for me has by far the most realistic and accurate depiction of a non-verbal autistic person that I've ever seen in a movie, which was like a, a really, really interesting little bonus for me in this movie. And of course, because it's, you know, it's like the main character's son, I'm I, it, it just fills me with a sense of dread because obviously I feel very protective of my own little brother who's nonverbal autistic. So, you know, very much added an air of real world horror to the proceedings for me. Um, I do think that the climax of this movie kind of goes just a little bit off the rails. It's one of those things where like they introduce like, like a mechanic to defeat the monster that is, uh, um, that is a, a little bit over convoluted. Like, I I don't really think it gelled with a lot of the other... Like, I I really like the real building in this movie because of how simple it was and how straightforward it was. And then I feel like the mechanic for actually defeating the uh, the demonic spirit was uh, a little bit convoluted. But that's really my only nitpick. I still think this was a very effective horror film. I, I would say Talk to Me is still probably... I would put Talk to Me a little bit ahead of this. Just because Talk To Me definitely had more immediate editing, it was shocking in a similar kind of vein to this. And also Talk To Me just has a straight up, like, all-time great horror ending. But this is still good, man. This is still, like, among the most memorable horror of 2023. And 2023 has not been that strong of a year for horror. Uh, Colby, yes. Terrible idea to watch this movie while you eat. I could not even have popcorn with this movie. It's you just can't. You you cannot engage with this movie and eat at the same time. It is it is borderline impossible. I challenge anyone to do it. All right. Let's see. Next up we have do 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 sorry, Dragon. We have uh painkillers or pain hustlers. I mean Thank sorry. You. Pain hustlers. Yes, pain hustlers. Uh, I, I just another just find... thing about the Sacklers because we there's been so many things about the Sacklers. It's well, kind of ridiculous. Again, not the Sacklers. Tangentially related to the Sacklers, same industry. Oh, I think you just mean the opioid crisis, Sticky. But yes, so interesting <laughs> how we, we've gotten three adaptations of the opioid crisis, each one highlighting a different aspect of, of the three pillars of said crisis. Mm-hmm. You got dope sick with the doctors, you got painkillers with the Sacklers, and now we have the salesmen, the Will Poulters getting the, getting the show, getting the movie now. And it's just all Will Poulter. He plays every role. That'd Very dynamic performance. Would be funny. He, he has the chops. <laughs> to do it. He's got the chops to do it. No, he doesn't. All right, fine, he doesn't. I think so. Jesse Plemons might have the chops to do it. I like Will Poulter, but <laughs> right, anyway, no, seriously though. Uh, yeah. So unlike those, uh, those are shows. This is a film. Uh, Emily Blunt, she's the star. Basically, she's kind of like the. Uh, you know, it's kind of interesting in each of the. Um, 
you look at painkillers has like we have like the female kind of like sales salesperson for uh you know essentially for our pill mills if you will like she's the representative selling the products to the doctors and everything and again we've seen this we've seen the mechanics of this and all through all the other shows leading up to this so essentially is just from that perspective of her as the main character as like the uh the enterprising saleswoman uh, now this this is set after oxycontin. So this is like a cancer drug. So it's a different drug. So it's not connected to the sex. It's after all the initial opioid crisis stuff happened. So people are a little bit more on their guard, which is why Emily Blunt has to be really crafty and underhanded in mm-hmm. this film. Uh, so so again, it's about this uh, you know a cancer drug, and the main reason it's a cancer drug is that it uh, and again it's it's based on a true story and everything, but it's just the fact that it's about uh, how it pays out. That's the thing. So basically, like selling to one doctor like would get you a, a, a very large payday, and that's the thing. This is almost like a, almost like a Ponzi scheme of a uh, of kind of like a hence the hustlers kind of a, almost a Ponzi scheme of of a kind of a pill operation here. Like she's desperate for money, uh, which you know is kind of a rise and fall success story with Chris Evans as her partner in crime here. Chris Evans is in this movie. Main reason I watched it, as you can probably guess. <laughs> But uh, yes, I got you know, Evans is great. He plays a con man of a salesman who's kind of her mentor. And can I get the? Uh, there's this really great moment where she, again, she uh, she was in prison briefly, and she came out, and she has a daughter, uh, a daughter with like uh, has epilepsy or has like seizures and stuff, and she's kind of suffering from that. So that's the main reason she's doing all this. So the idea she walks in and Evans like, basically hit on her at, like a strip club because she started off as a stripper. Mm-hmm. And then basically uh, he invites her and pretty much almost as if he's hitting on her. And she shows up at the place of work after she tracked him down. And he's like, all right, come on in. Cause he does see like, she's really good at reading people, which is why he gave her the job. And he bolsters her resume in a really funny way. <laughs> he's like bolsters everything <laughs> she has. Like you get, you get uh, any, any degrees like, here okay, we're going to like, uh, she just, he just kind of pumps it up in the room and gives her a job on the spot in a really impressive way. It was, it was pretty solid. <laughs> So look, overall, the movie look, the movie's not bad, but it's just it's a little long and the, it's no dope sick. I mean, out of the three things that we've gotten, I don't think we've ever quite measured up to how great dope sick was, and that's that's stiff competition, though. Yeah, and I mean, like I said, it's like I, I thoroughly <laughs> enjoy dope sick, but like yeah. it's heavy subject matter. I don't need to watch three different things about. Well, that's it. the that's thing, Tiki. Nice where dope six heavy subject matter, uh, painkillers is funnier, and I think you'd like it. Um, but this, this on the other hand, is like a thing where for you, I could see it like you know, like it droning on for you. That's the thing where it feels sure, like it doesn't sure. have the advantage. It's like long, but not episodes long. It, it feels like it, it, a part of you feels like it might have benefited from episodes, but then again, it would have extended the story. So it's in a real weird gray area there, you know, where it's mm. like. It's a story that we've seen before. Like we've literally seen this part of the story incorporated in both shows. You know, it, it's a, that's the thing. I mean, it's it, I. It's not bad at all, but you know, it's just, it's just pales in compare. It's it's at the bottom of the totem pole of the three opioid related shows. You know. Sure. All right. Okay. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, Dragon. Yesterday, I got a chance to see Priscilla. And uh, this is the Sofia Coppola movie, obviously mm-hmm. about the uh, the marriage between Priscilla Presley and Elvis. Um, Dragon, I gotta tell you, I love this. Real okay, I'm I'm really interested. Like, so was this? This was good then. This was damn good. This is honestly among my favorite Sofia Coppola movies. What has um, she done? Uh, she did Lost in Translation. She did The Beguiled back in the day. That mm-hmm. that was the Colin Farrell movie I really liked. Um, uh, she's done a bunch of stuff. Uh, but, uh, yeah, this is... Uh, Dragon, the really great thing about this, I feel like, is that whereas um, the, the Elvis movie from last year... Dragon, you and I, we did not agree on that movie at all. Um... I thought it was, like, that movie literally gave me a migraine. It felt like a three-hour music video. I hated the Tom Cruise, the Tom Hanks performance. Tom Cruise as that role would have been really interesting, though. Could you imagine Tom Cruise in that role? Well, we kind of saw that a little bit in the, uh, <laughs> in Tropic Thunder. Right, right. <laughs> um... So, Dragon, essentially, you know what my reaction to, like, the first half hour of this movie is? I was sitting in the theater, and um, 
a certain collection of words formed in my mind in comparison to the actual Elvis movie. Can you guess what those words were? What were they? This is a movie. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what was yeah, your first um, clue, Tiki? What was your first clue in the movie theater? That you this know was what I movie? mean. You know what I mean. <laughs> like, this has some real drama to it, man. They do not, I will say this, they do not shy away from the age gap and how sketchy it is. So, Dragon, um, what I love about this is that it is, this is most definitely, most definitely, without question, the most, like, nefarious Elvis you are ever going to see on screen. Like, this is, like, you know, the Elvis in this movie is opportunistic and kind of a creeper, and there is very much a strong argument to say that he groomed her, but... At the same time, it's not entirely unsympathetic. And you can you can see the connection that they made. Honestly, Dragon, she's the one, as far as like the sexual component goes, she's the one that's kind of throwing her throwing herself on him. And he very much um, you know, it's actually kind of a big point of tension where he's very much, you know, wanting to do the respectable thing and wait until marriage. So that that is an interesting kind of like you know, point in his favor. So it's like, it's, it's very, it's very morally ambiguous. Um, So the first half is basically like, you know, kind of like the sketchiness of courting her. Like, you know, it's like, it's literally dragon. You, you see the perspective of, you know, like just being like, she was in ninth grade when she met him dragon ninth fucking grade. And, you know, so you get, you get the perspective of like, you know, the whirlwind of, you know, like, going from, oh, my God, like, fucking the Elvis Presley is interested in me. And, you know, just that being, like, the ultimate, you know, schoolgirl dream at the time. And then you get that contrasted with, you know, like, the girls at school are kind of talking shit about her behind her back. And and it's hard to even focus on school, you know. And it's hard to, like, how can you, after spending weekends with Elvis, how can you go back to school and learn about the fucking food pyramid? You know what I mean? And then the second half, uh, where it focuses more on the marriage, focuses uh, on Graceland, it is very much like a claustrophobic kind of slow burn thriller almost, where the whole idea, Dragon, is it's kind of like the Gilded Cage thing, right? Where it's like, she is, uh, you know, she's in theory, she's living the dream, but in reality, it's like she can't even like go in the front yard of Graceland and take her little dog on a walk without the paparazzi just swarming the place. And so there's a lot of really interesting push and pull. The film has a really, really compelling forward momentum to it. I really love the editing. It does some great work showing the passage of time. I think uh, both the lead performances of Elvis and Priscilla, they're relative newcomers. Uh, so you really wouldn't recognize their names, but both of them are just great. Um, I feel like the guy playing Elvis is very much not doing an impression of Elvis, but he's kind of like, you know, it's one of those celebrity performances where he's embodying the spirit of the character without, you know, like I, I feel like Austin Butler's whole thing and Austin Butler did a great job, of course, but his whole thing was just kind of getting the voice down perfectly Whereas this guy kind of made it his own thing. Like he looks a lot like Elvis dragon. Like he, like, like visually it's, it's spot on, but you know, performance wise, he's very much kind of doing his own thing. It's like what, what you get to see a lot more of in this movie than you did in the Boz Lerman Elvis is you get to see like the more private soft spoken side, which, which was a factor in the Boz Lerman version, but Like, that's pretty much, like, all the Elvis we get. Like, we don't really get a lot of the bravado showman Elvis in this movie. It's a lot of, like, very quiet moments. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm pretty high on this one, Dragon. I would say it's definitely going to be, currently it's in my top 10 of the year. I don't know if it's going to stay there. It'll definitely be in my top 20 at least. It's just there's, 
you know, there's between like stuff like poor things and uh, and a couple others. Uh, there's definitely some competition, but yeah, I'm uh, I'm pretty high on this thing, man. I I really really thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, all right. Now we get to some TV. Yeah. All right. So Dragon, I just I just want to take the time to like. I don't know. I hate that, like, we're literally coming upon the same situation again with Loki, where it's like, I, I guess with Loki, it's not as bad, because at least it's going to be the second week of November and not the first week. But, like, Ahsoka ended the first week of, Oct- of October, and we're just now getting around to t- talking about our thoughts. Um, Dragon, I'm not going to lie, with Ahsoka... Honestly, I like the first half a lot better than I like the second half. Um, I think the big thing with Ahsoka that they did not really stick to landing on, and I'm pretty sure you're going to agree with me on this, I'd be surprised if you didn't, is I feel like all the stuff with Balin just kind of gets pushed to the wayside by the end of the series. It's like he just like his relevancy to the story just slowly fizzles out. And that's super disappointing. Um, I'm not, I'm really not crazy about the ending. I'm really not. I, I, I love what they did with Ezra. Um, I love the, uh, you know, the reunion between Ezra and Sabine. I thought it was uh, appropriately satisfying from a viewer point of view. And you know what? I even can see what they were doing in the long run with the way that Rosario Dawson was playing Ahsoka in terms of, like, you know, being stoic and reserved and having her walls up and slowly putting her walls down as the series goes on. Um, I love Hu Yang. Uh, but ultimately, Dragon, like, frankly, I hated the C-3PO cameo. That's one thing that was kind of a bridge. Wait, too really? Far. Yeah, it was very much like okay, like like we're done doing this this plot with uh, with Hera. Like, how are we just gonna wrap it? It felt very cheap. Felt very cheap. Um. So yeah, ultimately, unfortunately, like I definitely think that like I haven't seen Kenobi. I definitely think this is better than Book of Boba Fett. I definitely think it's better than uh, Mando season three, but. I don't think it's anywhere near the same level of consistency as something like Andor or uh, Mando seasons one and two. So it's kind of just in this weird sort of gray area middle ground where I feel like it's very much good, but not great. And the great parts of it, namely the Ray Stevenson stuff kind of just fizzles out by the end, which is very unfortunate, especially, especially given the, the, the fact that we're never going to see Ray Stevenson reprised the character. So, you know, even if they do bring the character back and do more stuff with him, we're never going to see that same interpretation. And that's just kind of frustrating for me. I mean, look, uh, with Soka, I, I thought it was nice to see Filoni, you know, see Filoni's story continue. But the, the problem with the show for me is that Ahsoka got lost in her own show. You know, it ended up being like Rebels, the sequel, which is which is fine, but it's like we should have just been a rebel. Yeah, honestly, that's that's the thing. Ultimately, where it's like, man, Ahsoka, what we got with her was interesting, but we never really paid it off fully. The best episode we got with her was that fifth episode with her and Anakin. That was great, and that's where we started to peel back the layers and see what does she think about herself in 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 conjunction with how things went with Anakin. Like that's really interesting. And race every Ray Stevenson scene is great but you're right we uh we really i was a, the end the ending with him was a mistake he we feels borderline it. irrelevant to the finale well here's the thing okay here's what they did um it feels like such a mistake ending his story ambiguously because one the thing they're implying is a very it's a super deep cut to clone wars mm-hmm. actually where it's like essentially he's on these stone statues and there's significance with the stone statues, but no, no general audience is gonna get that. <laughs> no one's gonna right, know. Right, right. And even if, like, even assuming the audience does, it's like just the fact that we're leaving it on like, and he's just standing on these important statues. <laughs> you know, like the so that that's really that's really a shame. Like overall, I thought the show. Look, overall, I thought the show was good because of the elements that we kind of like went through that we liked, but it, it just it all of it feels. 
like very dependent on this Filoni movie, which now, given the state of Star Wars and Disney and everything, is questioning. Like, is we don't know that. I, I really don't know if that's even going to happen. That's the thing. Point. Like yeah. it just feels like the movie. It feels like we're making a show that's super dependent on Filoni being able to pay all this off, versus like us getting an actual ending to like a, to like a good standalone season of television or something here. Of like you know, but I don't know. It just. Not even standalone to like, like obviously there's a lot of rebels in there, so it's kind of a continuation. But you know what I mean, though. It feels like we're not really getting a, a definitive ending because we live, we leave things off very cliffhangery. The, like mm-hmm. the main point of this whole show feels like we're going to reintroduce Thrawn, which we do, but it, it's just not the best choice for the show in the long run. Of like, hey, our Ahsoka show ends up with you know we've we've stranded them. And, uh, you know, Stram, Thrawn got away, and, uh, you know, I mean, Ezra got back, I guess, but, you know, it's uh, it Balin stand on staff. Frankly, that, I, that also kind of frustrated me, the fact that, like, you know, like, Ezra's back, Ezra gets to reunite with Hera and stuff, but the whole gang isn't back together. That, yep. that frustrates me, Dragon. That feels like we made no progress, honestly. And, of course, let's talk about the biggest sin of all the show committed. No Hondo. Still no Hondo. <laughs> so that's no, yet again, no another thing dragon, was... like, yeah, no Hondo is that, like, that, you know, we just, we need to see him at some point. But I think really the big sin the show committed was no Zeb. Well, at least I mean, I, I understand that he's doing his own thing right now in the story, but, like, at least to give him a cameo, Dragon. We were able to give fucking Clancy Brown a cameo. I mean, it's the fact that at least we saw him in Mando, so at least he's around. No, I, I, I get that, but honestly, the fact that we saw him in Mando kind of makes it even more weird that he doesn't at least pop up here. Well, I, T, I'm going to guess the idea is they want they want to bring in Zeb. We can bring in everyone, and we can't bring in <laughs> everyone if half of them are hopefully <laughs> including Hondo. That's the, oh god, yes, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> T, it really feels like Filoni's like going to bring everyone back in this movie. But dear God, man, what? Just give us the movie. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay, next up we have Behind the Attraction, Season 2. So, Dragon, as you know, I wasn't the biggest fan of Season 1. And going into Season 2, I was kind of, like, viewing it as just kind of like an obligation. Like, all right, let's 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 just do it. I'm going to see some cool behind-the-scenes footage, which is, like, you know, more or less, like, the big reason to watch this show to begin with for the hardcore fans, like, uh, but I'm going to get a lot of dad jokes that are not really that funny. And um, Dragon, honestly, I was pleasantly surprised. I, I think that while the show, the tone of the show is still very much the same as far as like, you know, having the lighthearted humor and the Paget Brewster narration and everything. I think that they really fine tuned the actual humor in this season for me and, you know, humor subjective and everything, but for me, I, I think I can place my finger on it. I'm curious if you have the same thing, where I think in season one, they kind of relied on just, like, the Paget Brewster narration itself being the form of the humor, which kind of grated on my nerves because it essentially it kind of turned into a lot of dad jokes, and it kind of felt like like it was, like, derailing the point a lot of the times. Like, a lot of the times in the first season, it'd just be, like, the Paget Brewster narration would be, like, so this one thing happens, but no, it's actually this other thing that you weren't expecting. You know, stuff like that. And I feel like in season two, while we still have wordplay humor like that, I feel like they rely a lot more on editing humor, which is a lot more refreshing. Like a good example that I can think of is in the uh, in the episode that's all about food, where they keep cutting back to the, to the ladies, uh, you know, like, like always say yes to churros <laughs> like and they keep cutting back to it you know and it's like i so it's like the rhythm of the humor and the editing and uh they do some really funny stuff with tony baxter in the big thunder mountain episode just as far as the editing goes i really feel like that's the uh that's the big thing that kind of separates this uh this season is that i feel like the humor is a little bit more versatile and it makes it just more palatable for me and also, oddly enough, Dragon, uh, there is actually some stuff that I did not know that I actually learned, which, you know, I, that, that might not sound like a big statement considering that's kind of the point of the show, but like, 
for me is like as huge of a Disney Parks fan that feels like I have literally consumed every notable book that's ever been written about the Disney Parks. I, I don't say that lightly. I literally think that's more or less the case for me. Um, specifically in the food episode, I definitely learned some stuff that uh, I hadn't known before. For example, I never knew that Walt Disney himself was responsible for the innovation of the uh, the trash cans with you know with the with the flappy uh, you know with the flappy doors uh, you know. So yeah, uh, pleasantly surprised by this one. I, I I found it to be a lot more palatable than the first season for me. Yeah, I uh, you know I well I'm already a sucker for like you know the toys and the movies that made us thing, which essentially is uh you kind of the, the at least for the first season specifically, I think you kind of what it kind of went on about. It's uh it's very much in the DNA of kind of the how we're presenting you know like the, the behind the scenes of the attractions here. But yeah, it's uh you know for me I just I just learn a lot during these things. You know, there's a lot of behind the scenes facts. Uh, you know, like the you know the you know, the attraction history of it all, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's so funny, like, before the season, I mean, I didn't know a new season was was coming, it was kind of dropped. I was just, for uh, for research purposes, for uh, for Haunted Holiday Hijinks, I rewatched the episode of the Haunted Mansion, mm-hmm. and then I watched Star Tours just for the heck of it, and it was like, it was kind of timed very, very uniquely there. Uh, so yeah, season two, we get uh, you know, Pirates. Uh, I think my favorite episodes were uh, the in- Indiana Jones one, uh, for the nostalgia that I have with the Indiana Jones the stunt show, and then we mm-hmm. kind of went into everything else there. Uh other thing, though, I'm with you 100. The food, uh, the food episode was fascinating. It really was, though, right? I mean, T- I was just in from the beginning of like this. This is this is Walt's favorite kind of food here. Like, okay, that's kind of also also that little recipe card that they show off. You know, where where he has like all the suggested ingredients. Mm-hmm. That was at the Walt Disney Family Museum. I walked by mm-hmm. that every shift. I mean, I just love the fact that Walt was a real meat and potatoes guy. Oh, he totally was. Yeah, he totally was. So I love this. I was just learning that already. It's like, man, I'm already in this food episode. It can only go get better from here, and it did. I mean, take you the gray. I never saw the gray stuff, man. That was amazing. Oh, you've never seen the gray stuff? No, yeah, I've never seen before. I've never. I've, obviously, I've seen the movie, but I never saw it like. Uh uh-huh. In live action, it was amazing. It's like, oh my god, it was dazzled by something. Then they had like the, you know, the bow, the Pixar bow. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Not just the short, but I mean, like the bow dumplings made the short. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of really good stuff there. We did a deep dive on uh, Epcot. Uh, yes, yeah, so there's a lot of really, it's very informative uh, as as per usual. So I, I I'm I'm very down for this uh, for this sort of thing. You know, and again, I I agree with you. It does feel like we did a lot more clever editing this this time around than we had uh, previously. But it was kind of a thing where I remember when you brought up your Chris. Your Christmas of the first season, I was kind of scoffing at it. Hey, come on, it's harmless dad jokes. It's from a little dad humor, but you know what? Uh, upon the rewatch of of the um, the first season, like, yeah, I'm a, little, a little heavy with. Uh, I don't dad mind dad humor. It's just like it's a little much, you know. It just felt like it was too frequent. That was that, my the, problem. I, with I, it. I agree with you. It does, it does feel a little like you know, like on the rewatch of the first season, it's like. Okay, Padgett, let's just, let's just... Let's... I mean, it's like if you're doing an episode on the Jungle Cruise, then sure, throw in all the dad humor we can handle. You know what I mean? Yeah, but like, exactly. But it doesn't like, have to be in every episode, you know? It's like Bruce... Like, the yeah, Small sure. World episode doesn't have to have a ton of dad humor in it. You know what well, I mean? Well, it's not even so much the humor. It's just like, oh, oh okay, Brewster, let's, well, let's go through it before we, inter- before we interject here. Exactly, let's, exactly, let's, you know, let's... yeah just go through a little bit more before like i said it's like she still does do a little bit of interjecting here and there but i really do feel like what the humor does is it'll take like these little like quirky moments from the interviews and play around with that a lot more, yeah which, which i think is a lot more palatable also like tony uh the uh, the big thunder mountain thing with uh, tony baxter's uh, cameo was really funny. i i fucking love the story of like <laughs> like tony baxter like the photo yeah that yeah he, he took, and it's like exactly the same yep, him looking at the looking at the paper also <laughs> but tony baxter is just such a gem man he really is Yep. All right. All right. So yeah, uh Gen V. I, I, I definitely need to catch up on this. I saw the first episode. Yeah, so this uh this is a spin-off designed to bridge uh seasons three and four of the boys, kind of giving us something to kind of chew on uh while we're waiting for season four. It's uh it's a fun exploration of the world, uh in a really uh 
you know, in a really, uh, really interesting way. You know, we, uh, you know, the writing's good. Uh, you know, the um, we have some fun subversions as we tend to do in the, the universe of the boys. There's a um, it, here's the, basically to me the sell of the show is that it's like what if we see the likable uh, we have these likable soups that are kind of woken up to uh, what's going on at Vought. That's the interesting thing for me because we portrayed the soups traditionally with very few exceptions in the boys as traditionally they're very self they're very just terrible people outright just utter utterly terrible people we're kind of peeling back the layers and finding the gray that kind of like redeems them in a sense you know like they're young so they haven't been really corrupted by like these guys are, the idea of like college kind of breaking your spirit is kind of it's kind of the theme of the show uh -huh. which is kind of interesting um so you know it's However, I mean, there's crazy, messed up, cynical stuff, as you'd imagine. There's puppets. There's all sorts of craziness. In well, this I mean, thing, just the man. main character's origin, for one. That's that I, is exactly. something I did see. I was so wild when they yeah. did that. It was like, oh, this is how you... I was so in when I saw that. Like, man, the show gets it. They're they're doing the boys. It's not just uh -huh, like a... Uh -huh. I was a little worried. I'm not going to lie to you. I was a little worried about it because it's kind of a thing that's not per se from the comic. And I'm not, I'm not saying the comic is necessarily better than the shows, but it's like a thing like, okay, we're really fully in boys' world now, like with the show. And uh, we're we're doing a we're, – I think we're in good shape because they're, they're acting like an extra, like, you know, spoke to the wheel. It's like it, – here's the thing. We're exploring the world in a supplemental way, which technically means we don't need it, but I kind of like having it there to define the world and flesh it out. So it's a good world building show. So I, I, mean, I had a good time with it. I thought it was very well done. Yeah, I definitely need to get caught, caught up on it for sure. Yeah. All right. Okay. Fall of the House of Usher. This is the latest Mike Flanagan Netflix opus. And Dragon, honestly, I'm like, this is definitely not your type of show. It's got a lot of body horror shit. It's got mm. a lot of disturbing elements to it. I really wish you could watch it, though, because it's got one of the all time best Mark Hamill performances. Now he's in this. He is. He is. Mm. Um, so essentially, the premise of this is that um, the Usher family, it, it, it's kind of. It, it's very succession dragon. It's 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 essentially succession with a supernatural twist. And honestly, while we're at it, throw in a little bit of dope sick because yes, it is a pharmaceutical company and that does come into play. <laughs> but uh essentially the Ushers are a family of, you know, like the Ushers um created this kind of like miracle painkiller. And that is what gave them their fortune. And the title, The Fall of the House of Usher, kind of uh, kind of alludes to the fact that literally, Dragon, there are, like, I think something like six or seven, maybe more, Usher children that the, uh, that the main uh, father figure has had with, like, you know, like well, is this a four or five different women. Is this a parody of the Sacklers, or is this like like a like a real family? It's an adaptation of Poe, actually. Oh, yeah. Um, and it's not just uh, it's not just the House of Usher. Um, it's like basically every episode adapts a Poe story, and that's that's the really unique thing about it. So, like, we get the pit and the pendulum, we get the Telltale Heart, we get the Raven. Um, but it's all told within the context of this family. And uh, essentially, Dragon, uh, Bruce Greenwood plays uh, Roderick Usher. And Dragon, he is fantastic. Well, I mean, of course. I mean, he's a Batman, for crying out loud. Of course. Oh. But I, I'm saying, like, he is, uh, like, there are a lot of scenes of him just, like, as an old man, just kind of, like, contemplating his past and contemplating, like, where it all went wrong. And it, he is just so magnetic. Um I don't know, Dragon. Honestly, there's a lot of moving parts to this. Like, I don't want to just sit here and, like, explain the whole setup. But what I will say is that Mark Hamill plays the family lawyer. And, Dragon, he is so fucking good. He is so fucking good. Like, because he's... he Essentially, Dragon, his, his character is, like, halfway between Saul Goodman and Mike. Where it's, like, he's got kind of, like, the sleaziness of Saul Goodman... But also, like, you know, the utilitarian, like, you know, like, no nonsense, we gotta clean up this mess vibe of a Mike Ehrman Trout. 
And uh, I love that. I mean, it's it's such a great character for him. And it's he, he is pretty prominent throughout the show. Like, a lot of times when Mark Hamill has a live-action performance, he's not, like, one of the main fixtures. But honestly, he really is here. Um, let's see. Also, Henry Thomas plays one of the uh, sons. And he is also just... Total piece of shit, total scumbag performance from Henry Thomas, Dragon. If you want to see Henry Thomas in an, in an entirely different light. Um, I, I don't love this nearly as much as I love something like uh, um, uh, Midnight Mass or Haunting of Hill House. I definitely don't think it's in that category. Honestly, mostly just because I did kind of feel like you know, it is sort of like, it's got a lot of shades of, of succession with like the, you know, the family trauma and the kids are all messed up because of living in a, you know, in such an elite rich family and what comes with that. So honestly, it felt like it was kind of recycling a lot of the same ground as succession. Whereas I feel like a lot of Flanagan's other work just feels a lot more fresh but I still really, uh, it's still up there. I mean, it's definitely among the better shows that I've watched this year, for sure. So, uh, yeah, you know, it's it's kind of a shame that, like I said, you can't necessarily, like, I would not recommend it to you in spite of the Hamill stuff. But honestly, Dragon, if I do, I, I might be on the lookout for, like, just a Mark Hamill supercut. If I do find that, I might send it your way. That would be good. Mm-hmm. I need to find a Bira Formiga supercut for the Conjuring movies, too. I'm sure that's probably a lot easier to find. All right. Okay, what's up for you? Uh, really quick, Colby says, uh, Mike Flanagan does no wrong. Love this, as I've loved all the other ones before. Did you love the uh, the Midnight Club, though, Colby? Did you love the Midnight Club? I feel like that's kind of the outlier. It's like I, I felt like that show was good. It definitely had some standout moments, but I don't think many people loved it. Okay, uh, Dragon, what's next for you? Only Murders in the Building, Season 3. All right. Yeah, so uh, this was great. Uh, again, I can't recommend the show any more highly. It's a parody of, you know, true crime podcast with uh, this great cast. You know, you got Selena Gomez, you got Steve Martin, you got Martin Short. You know, it's, they're the trio of the show. They play off each other very well uh season three uh is set on broadway you know because they're in new york that it's it's a, a murder happens during a broadway show <laughs> and uh you have you have a big you have two big guests this season you got uh you have paul rudd and you have meryl streep yeah a lot of twists in the mystery as there as there tend to be on this show uh there's a big question going into the show of like if it was going to get a season four or not and uh, basically the thing performs so well yeah it's coming back for a four i mean i do wonder in the long run how much how much longer we can keep this puppy going but uh yeah i mean steve martin's pretty much like i mean i i have such a good time working on the show i don't think i'm gonna do anything else i think i'm just this like you know whenever the show ends that'll be it for me in terms of like, you know, acting gigs but yeah, Steve Martin has a really great uh, running gag this season where uh, he he has anxiety performing on Broadway. So when he when he does, um, he go there's this apparently this actor thing which I think it has like a real life basis, but probably not this the one for one thing that they uh, they they show here is a great visual thing where when he has a, when he panics on stage trying to do this really hard thing, he, he goes to the white room, which is hysterical and apparently. When he goes to the white room, he has almost like a Tourette's esque thing where he's like saying like he's doing horrible unseen things that we we're seeing him like being all happy go lucky in a white room. You know, it's like imagine that scene in, in the cat and Howard. The cat gets you know hit hit between the legs and he's like doing like you know like the fun seesaw thing. Like imagine something like that. And then apparently that's like something horrific is happening. <laughs> so that's it, it's it's I don't I really just get. I can't recommend the show any more highly to you, Tiggy. It's a son you kind of have to watch. Um, no, I wish it wasn't on Hulu. <sighs> I'm sorry. I'm, but he's like, you love Dope Sick, though. It's a hard watch, mm -hmm. but you like Dope Sick. 
Yeah, well, Hulu screwed me over. I'm not going to go back to it. All the all the streaming services who screw me over though, they all do. No, they and didn't screw me over like Hulu did. I literally signed up for an account on Hulu, and they said that I didn't. So I'm good. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. So there's also music. And if you think I'm the only one who has that problem, literally watch the video that I made about it. There's a bunch of other people in the comments that have the same problem. Hmm. All right. right. Okay, uh, let's see. For me, next up, we have The White Lotus Season 1. Dragon, this is a show that I have been meaning to get around to for a long time, and I am very glad that I did. I'm excited to check out Season 2. It's a Mike White. Mike. Mike. Jesus Christ. Mike White. Mike makes white, apparently. (laughs) Mike White. Um written and directed show uh very very much leaning into the uh kind of social commentary element of mike white's humor uh but the great thing about this show though is that it is also very much like an anxiety inducing um deconstruction of the kind of like the customer is always right sort of vibes of the tourism service industry which i thought was just like a really really Like, that to me is, like, such a Mike White thing to do, which is to, uh, I I feel like one of his specialties is really kind of, like, taking, like, mundaneities and, like, you know, like, average day-to-day stuff and, uh, you know, and really, like, elevating the drama of it. The cast here is fantastic. We have uh, Jennifer Coolidge, Dragon, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, this is going to be the the role that Jennifer Coolidge is going to be known for. Like, this is, this is her magnum opus performance like this is the best performance that she has ever given she is like phenomenal um she essentially plays like a hotel heiress like you know like one of those uh one of those types of women who like is just like disgustingly wealthy and has not had to work a day in her life it is very pampered uh but the thing about her character is that she doesn't really like she's been through a lot of childhood trauma with her mother and her mother just died, and so she's at Hawaii trying to uh, trying to uh, spread her mother's ashes, but she's having a hard time with that. Gets wrapped up in a bunch of other shit. Uh, a lot of her character kind of comes down to like how oblivious rich people can be to the plights of other people, even if they're sympathetic to other people. Um, and I feel like it's explored really, really well with her. Uh, just for reference, Dragon, the White Lotus is just the name of the hotel. Um, it's just like a super exclusive, like luxury resort in Hawaii. So that's that's why it's called the White Lotus, just in case you were wondering. Um, one of the other real standout characters here is the uh, the hotel manager. Um, the actor Dragon very much gives me a Taika Waititi vibe. Like I'm sure he must from be from from New Zealand. I mean, he is, uh, you know, it is very, very similar to like a Taika Waititi type of performance, but he, he, he does such a good job because it's like, you can tell that he just hates some of these clients, right? Like he just hates some of these guests. Like he cannot stand them, but he does such a good job with, you know, keeping the, uh, you know, that, that face, you know, like where it's like, he is very much like the customer is always right. Like he kind of like represents that mindset, even though behind the scenes, you could tell he is just as sick of these people as every, as his, uh, as the people that work under him. And that's a great, like kind of performance there. Um, Steve Zahn, man, we get a big meaty Steve Zahn role here. And, uh, he plays a suburban dad and it's it's really interesting to see him in that role, especially because I just watched another Steve Zahn movie where, you know, he was very much kind of like in his, uh, you know, in his younger days. So it, it was kind of like a, a little bit of Steve Zahn whiplash between the two performances. Hmm. Um, Aubrey Plaza plays probably the most sympathetic character in the whole thing, where uh, her whole character is that she's a very much a middle class woman who has married into a wealthy family but dragon her newlywed husband is just like the ultimate douche like he like he is just like the ultimate 
ultimate douchebag. And she basically spends the whole show essentially, like, kind of, like, slowly sinking in, like, oh, my God, what am I doing? I have made a huge mistake marrying this guy. And we get to kind of see, like, the tension of that, like, slowly unravel. So a lot of this show is just, like, that that slow boiling tension and, you know, like, that you get from the uh, from the push and pull of, you know, a, a hotel that very much prides itself on you know the customer is always right mentality um versus the customers themselves who because they are so fucking rich and elite like really have no common courtesy for the average working staff at all and just the uh I, it is anxiety inducing in the best of ways dragon i i would recommend this i actually think you would get a kick out of it i think you'd really like some of the performances uh, the Hawaii setting is obviously like pretty gorgeous. The music is very unique. It kind of like it kind of takes um, essentially what the music does is it takes like traditional Hawaiian chants and uh, you know hula music and stuff like that and like warps it into being anxiety inducing. So yeah, I had a lot of fun with this show, man. And like I said, I'm very excited to get to season two. As far as I know, with season two, Jennifer Coolidge is the only character who returns. I know that it's also set in Rome, or no, I think, uh, I think Sicily. I think it's in Sicily. So the whole, essentially, the show is, uh, it was only going to be a limited series, but essentially, uh, it's going to be, uh, every season is going to be like a different White Lotus resort around the world. So I think that's really a, a really interesting way to do it. So yeah, uh, definitely one of the highlights of the month for me. I thoroughly enjoyed myself watching this. Cool. All right. All right. Let me tell you about the Continental from the from the world of John Wick. Yeah, I'm just not a John Wick guy, so this is probably not going to appeal to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was uh, so I was hyped for this because you know I love the John Wick films, especially the Continental itself. It was very. I respect. I respect the John Wick films more than I like them. If that makes sense, like I I respect the heck out of the style, but for me it's just too much of the and they fight, 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 fight. You know, it's just too much of that for me. Right. Let's think. So uh, I was very sold on this just in premise. It's well cast. We have a young Winston and young uh, Sharon. You know, it's, but there's no John Wick in the shows, like set in the past. Here's the problem. With that comes a double-edged sword. Uh, instead of just having this be, okay, this is the Continental before John Wick really entered our story, which is what I was expecting and essentially what everyone was sold on, it's an origin story. Of John Wick? Well, no, 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 not of John Wick. No, oh, John of Wick. the Continental. Oh. Mm. So here's the problem. So the problem is... The problem I just is it's wanted... not fully formed. Like, it's not exactly what you want. The problem is the show... The, the conflict of the show is it's Winston before he became the manager of the Continental, which is the whole show I wanted. Yeah, <laughs> so this yeah, is, I can see that being So Mel issue. Gibson is in the show. Mel Gibson plays the guy who owned the Continental before Winston, apparently. And uh, the problem is... Bill Gibson's character, while incredibly violent, the problem is, when you're on the Continental Grounds, you're not supposed to be that violent. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So yeah, this, this is kind of like the whole gimmick. Yeah, of it. so this is what frustrated me. Bill Gibson's playing a guy who really doesn't get, he doesn't respect the place. You know, he's he just plays this guy who owns the place, doesn't really respect it. And like he brought, the only thing, good thing that he did is he hired Sharon. That's like the only good thing that he did. And it's a three, so the way they did this, it was like three, it was like, three movie length installments almost like short movie length. It's like out, over an hour, like three over an hour kind of uh, episodes. It's kind of like a limited series of events or three chunks of the story, literal three X structure, if you will. And I really, I didn't, I didn't really, didn't really click for me at all until part three, part three is all the goods. Cause that's actually, guess what? Set in the continental. <laughs> The whole thing is like, you know, uh, the Mel Gibson character is sending people after the Winston character outside the Continental for two for two parts, and it's not as interesting. Mm -hmm. So, the, again, the, everything pays off in the third in the third installment. Again, the, the show has some merit, but it's just not enough. The best part, one of the best parts of the show, outside of like, you know, you know young Sharon, 
is Jenkins. Jenkins is this character played by the great Ray McKinnon, who's a good actor. Uh, love he, he was in Dope Sick. He was Betsy's father in Dope Sick. Mm. Uh, he was in Ford vs. Ferrari. I love when this guy shows up. Ray McKinnon's a really good actor, and he gets to play the most John Wick assassin type of all the bunch. He's like this really tiki. You'd love this character. I would say just watch the show for the clips of this character. And the third, in, the, in the third part, his whole part of the mission, he's a sniper, okay? He's a sniper hitman. He's running point, making sure everyone's safe when they're inside the Continental. But he has to go into the apartment of this of this kindly older woman, and he kind of he's, you know, he's a bit of an older guy. He, he he likes her. He's kind of flirting with her, and he's he's very respectful about it. He's, he's he cares about plants and botany. And he's like he's like you know if I he has to essentially he has to kind of tie her up because she comes back early and he's just very cordial and very nice to her ah. as he's, as he's like killing people with the sniper rifle across the street. And it's, it's delightful. That's the hallmark of John Wick right there. And why isn't that the show? That's my question. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So I was a little let down by it. Yeah. That sounds kind of frustrating. Yeah. All right. South park. Joining the Panderverse. Have you heard about this at all, Dragon? I saw you know, a trailer of this when I was trying to watch Frasier. They okay. kept throwing the South Park trailer at me, so I've seen the trailer for this. So, yeah, essentially, uh, this is one of those... Uh, I, I'm never really sure what to do with these because it's like, it, you know, it's it's not really a movie. It's like a 45-minute, like, special episode. But they, 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 they've been doing this. And, frankly, I think this whole thing with Paramount Plus that they've been doing with South Park and these uh, these specials, I it, it worked out a lot better than I thought it would, because essentially what they're doing is they're just doing shorter seasons of South Park, which for me I, I'm fine with because I think the quality of each individual episode kind of goes up because they have more time to work on it, and then we're also able to get stuff like this, which is very high concept and very uh, very um, original. So essentially, like, as that trailer suggests, Dragon, the whole concept here is that it's a multiverse story. <laughs> it's so fucking ridiculous. <laughs> in which there is a multiverse where all the main characters in South Park <laughs> are fucking minority women. And Dragon, this just gets at the heart of, like, the whole... Like, there is literally, like, a moment where one of the characters is like... Yeah, Eric Eric Cartman is a black woman now. What's wrong with that? I don't see a problem with that. And it's like, uh, you know, and, and the character like specifically cites Miles Morales. Like, you kids didn't have a problem with a black Spider-Man. And it's like, yeah, dude, because Miles Morales is like his own like fleshed out character with, you know, like a whole, like it, it, it's a whole thing. You know, it's not just a race swap. Um, So I really think that this show, that, that this episode does a great job of, uh, kind of like both sides of the, uh, you know, the race swap argument, it very much leans into just like the, what I, what I kind of come down on, which like, frankly, I think, I think sometimes I'm fine with a race swap. Like, for example, I've always been fine with, with Haley Bailey. Um, I think it made sense for the little mermaid to be black, given that the thing takes place in the Caribbean and, uh, you know, the Sebastian of it all and Haley Bailey is, uh, you know, she knocked it out of the park with that role. So I'm fine with something like that. Um, but, you know, a lot of other times it does come across as a little bit pandering. Um, and this definitely gets at that. But Dragon, the reason to watch this is that there is an Eric Cartman version of Kathleen Kennedy in the multiverse. And it's amazing. It's fucking amazing. Would you like to know what this Kathleen Kennedy does? Oh, God, what does she do? <laughs> so, essentially, she's, like, controlling all of Disney. And, again, it's it's literally Eric Cartman. Like, it's a version of Eric Cartman that happens to be Kathleen Kennedy. So, it's got the Cartman voice and design and everything. But it's, like, she just keeps everything, every component of her life is she wants to put a chick in it. Make your day. I want it. Him. <laughs> and uh, it is just great. Like they, they're they're shooting the Bambi remake, and <laughs> Kathleen Kennedy's just just like, I want a chick in this movie, and I want her gay. Uh, Miss Kennedy, that really doesn't have anything to do with uh with Bambi. 
and there's literally a moment where she's ordering a, a linguine and she's like, excuse me, I believe I ordered this linguine with a chick in it and I wanted her gay. So it's, you know, it's very much like essentially what the joke is, Dragon, is the joke is kind of like it's coming down twofold where it's like it is poking fun at like just how, you know, like it, it kind of intentionally seems like it kind of feels like Kathleen Kennedy is intentionally sabotaging Star Wars with the choices that she makes. Like, for example, like, let's double down on a Ray movie, even though nobody likes her. Um, you know, stuff like that. But also, it does take the piss out of the people that just kind of, like, shit on Kathleen Kennedy for a living. You know, like, those people that just make all those clickbait videos. Like, it takes the piss out of them, too. Um, South Park has always been an equal opportunity satire, and I feel like we need South Park more than ever these days. And frankly, I think that this is kind of a watershed moment as far as, like, you know, shining a light on some of these issues and the fact that, like, the, you know, the overly, like, overly politically correct nature of some of this stuff is getting a little bit out of hand, even if it's well-meaning. Um... So, yeah, I I really enjoyed this quite a lot. Um, it was, like, frankly, all the Kathleen Kennedy stuff was just fucking amazingly funny to me. I just cracked up at it. I will say that this does have a subplot with Randy Marsh that is a little bit, like, uh, I don't know. It, it has to do with AI. Um, it's kind of like a commentary on AI and... I didn't think it was nearly as good as the uh, the actual Pandaverse stuff, um, but also just uh, I just want to say the uh, the actual like depictions of all the main South Park characters as minority women, Dragon. It's delightful just because as stupid of an idea as it is to have like the South Park kids as minority women, um, the characterization is pretty on point. Like, this, you know, the the black version of Cartman very much still feels like Cartman. Um, and that is delightful. Uh, there's, like, there's a version of Butters that is just, like, oh, my God. Like, as soon as you see her, it's like, yeah, that that is through and through. That is Butters. So, like, yeah, like, the actual, I honestly, I kind of wish we had like more of more interactions with the uh, the alternate characters and just cut out that Randy subplot because frankly that Randy subplot kind of dragged down the episode for me. But still dragon, I think that this is a, a a really good kind of indication that South Park is on the right track with these specials mixed with the shorter seasons. I think South Park as a show and as a as an IP is like more healthy than ever and I'm very glad of that because like I said like Culturally, I feel like we kind of need South Park in these times. All right. Uh, let's see. Colby says, um, the people like Star Wars Theory thinking it wasn't making fun of them, too, is hilarious. Yeah, no, that's the thing. Some people just think that it's just fully leaning into, like, you know, the anti-woke side of things. But it's really not. It really is, like, equal opportunity. I mean, it's there is a lot of points that they make against just, like, you know, the people that just endlessly shit on Kathleen Kennedy. So, yeah, it, it does go both ways, for sure. Woo! All right, Dragon. Uh, no, not news. We're not here for news. <laughs> well, there's still uh, one show left. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. Go ahead. All right, Psycho, The Lost Tapes of Ed Gein. Just what I want. More true crime content. Well, well, here the, the, I, I hear that, but follow me on this. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, th it's been a popular trope lately that we've done like the serial killer, uh, you know, like the uncovered tapes, so we can hear like uh, the the voices of of the famed, uh, you know, of, of the serial killers on like the tape the tape recorder device kind of framing device sort of thing. We've been doing that a lot lately. You know, we do it. Ted Bundy, we did it with Dave, Dave Milson, we did it with John Wayne Gacy, uh, Dahmer. We keep doing it and doing it and doing it. But this one, over the rest, is self-aware, which is really interesting. Where it's like there's like this gag at the top, I think, that says all Tiki, where it's like it has a disclaimer, but also it has like this, like, you know, the things you're about to see or hear are, you know, very violent. And then it has like this, this fun kind of thing. It's like it's four episodes. 
Um, and this is on like uh, this is on uh, M- I get what well, they call it MGM Plus. It used to be Epics, whatever they're calling it now. So I guess MGM Plus, whatever. Um, it's, it has like this little thing where it says, "No, seriously, we're not kidding." It's it just says mm-hmm. like, and then each episode it kind of gets like, uh, "No, really, more than the last episode." Oh, that's really keeps, fun. That's so really it kind of sets a precedent. Mm-hmm. Here's the this I felt this feels more unique than all the other ones, Tiki, because this one. Ed Gein has actually kind of a really unique place in serial killer dumb that everyone kind of forgets about because Ed Gein is technically the first serial killer. Now I don't mean like technically Jack the Ripper is the first. You know what I mean? I was like he's say the like H.H. Holmes yeah, yeah. much. All right, all right, follow, follow me on this. I mean like the <laughs> first like publicizes and like in you know when we had like you know like the thing where we could actually track this sort of thing versus okay. like you know like going back in the history books to like who was like you know like you know, the first serial killer serial killer. I mean in terms of like a like a known like let me put it this way. This is before we actually had the term serial killer. Like Ed Gein was when we actually labeled, gave someone like the term serial killer. You know? Mm. So it's the fact that this guy was, you know, he's he's like the serial killer that had like the pop cultural impact. And that's kind of the the approach that they're taking here, where they're talking about the guy, but they're also addressing the impact that he's had in like stuff like, you know, Psycho and Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Silence of the Lambs. And it's not glorifying him or like just trying to cash in on him here, but it's just kind of saying like, yeah, we were all rather shocked, shocked by him. And this is kind of how the world responded to it in an interesting ways. So it's kind of holding the mirror up to here's how the culture kind of kind of took to the guy in, in, in an odd way, because everyone was just kind of unilaterally just sort of like horrified by the unspeakable acts of this man to the point where it would sound like fiction in Hollywood, but it was real. So there's, I don't know, I, I found there's the approach there, plus the tapes really were just an excuse to talk about it. You know, it wasn't like necessarily like like an actual, like, like, like for example, the only time we've actually necessitated one of these lost tape things, it really feels like, was uh, Ted Bundy. And we had a movie which didn't really help the fact that here's the tapes of Ted Bundy, here's also that biopic on Ted Bundy, like, right, we're, right. we're giving you all the Bundy. But I don't know. It just, it just it just felt like this is like okay. Here's a guy we actually we've always heard about the atrocities. We never heard his voice. So there's the novelty. Okay, we heard his voice, but now we're really gonna like kind of kind of go through and really break down just kind of. But it's an analysis of a man versus like here's us telling you the same horrific story you've heard a million times before. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I thought it was like of all the times we've seen this thing rehashed, this is probably the most unique of all of those times. So it was that was. I'm not going to say it was a happy-go-lucky, delightful experience, but you know what? It was uh, it was clever. I thought it was clever. Okay, cool, cool. <sighs> All right, now we get to catch up. Yeah. Okay. Um, so for my mystery movie, Dragon, I decided for Halloween to watch a Stone Cold classic, one from a movie that's almost 100 years old, that I really should have gotten around to seeing right now. It's the sequel to one of my all-time favorite horror movies, and I've I've kind of like experienced it a lot through pop culture osmosis, but I've never actually sat down and watched the whole thing. So I saw Bride of Frankenstein. Hey, yeah. I'm not gonna lie, Dragon. I feel like this is a a situation where I kind of heard so much hype about it going in that. I'll say this much. I, I I didn't like it nearly like, you know, my passion for the original Frankenstein. I don't feel that same passion for this. I, I think that this is a good movie for sure. Very gothic. I think, I think the sets in this movie are probably like the main thing for me. And of course, uh, Elsa Lancaster is, uh, you know, pretty great. Um, I'm not going to lie, I kind of prefer Karloff when he's not talking um, as the monster. I just think that there's a lot of nuance to his performance in the first movie that you don't really need words for. Um, I also think that this movie starts out incredibly awkwardly with that stage play exposition stuff. Like, what the hell even was that? Um, I mean, I get what it is. It's essentially like you know, like a previously on Frankenstein, essentially, but it was so awkward. It, it did not start the movie off on a good foot. I think the uh, I think the movie is a little slow to start. It's, you know, we take quite a while to get to the actual bride. I don't know, Dragon. Like, I, like for me, the original Frankenstein just holds up so well, specifically because it's a movie where it's like, we hit the ground running in that movie. That movie opens, they're already fucking robbing graves. Um, 
Here it just kind of feels like it's it's bogged down a little bit more in like 1930s melodrama. Um, so again, it's you know, it's a solid movie, but like I've heard so many people say that this is like the best universal monster movie, and I just I vehemently disagree with that. I really do. I I don't think that I don't I don't even think this is as good as something like uh, I mean it's probably better than the Mummy, but. I don't think it's as good as Dracula. I don't think it's as good as the Wolfman. I definitely don't think it's as good as Creature from the Black Lagoon. Like, I mean, as far as like the Stone Cold classic Universal monster movies, I mean, granted, I'm sure, I'm sure among the Universal sequels, which I'm not really all that caught up on, I'm sure this is probably one of the better ones for sure. But I don't know, man. Like, I, I kept hearing that this is like James Whale's masterpiece, and I I like the first Frankenstein a hell of a lot more. Um, but again, it, it might be one of those situations where I kind of came in with too much hype. So, you know, so I, I'm glad I finally saw it, but it, it definitely uh, wasn't the uh, it didn't it didn't capture me the same the same way that I really wanted to wanted it to or expected it to. Unfortunately, so. Again, probably an issue of expectation management on my part. All right, haunted mansion dragon. Yes, yeah, so uh, the twenty, uh, you know, the twenty twenty three haunted mansion movie. Um, yeah, we, we cover this for uh, for high jinks. Uh, I I feel like just to summarize my thoughts, I thought it was close to being something good. Uh, you know, I love the lore that we gave to the whole Gracie Mansion of it all. Um, it feels like we couldn't settle on a protagonist. Like it should have been either, you know, Rosario Dawson or Lakeith Stanfield's character. Mm-hmm. But we, you know, we, I think we kind of went on the, you know, kind of picked the wrong path on that one. It's it's just you know there's uh it it nailed the ride elements, but it left we left the mansion way too often. You know, mm-hmm. we, we left the mansion way too often. The lore of the hatch, which is box. ironically something that's not a problem in the Eddie Murphy version. Yeah, yeah, oddly enough. So that's the thing. So like, it's that, and like the lore of the hat box goes, I think, really gummed up the works on the story. Way too movie. overly convoluted. Yeah, and it, it raised too many questions when it just should have been okay. So we we have everyone here. They can't. They have to go back to the mansion. They should just be stuck there till the end. That's how it should be. There are elements of a good movie here, but at the end of the day, just simply does not measure up to something like uh, the Muppet Haunted Mansion for me. <laughs> uh-huh, for sure, for sure. Okay. I would like to see them make a genuine attempt at a Phantom Manor movie, honestly. Hmm. We will see. Okay, uh, let's see. Sorry, Dre. Hold on, I kind of lost my space here. Let me... Ah! Uh, uh, what's my next thing, Dragon? I'm sorry. Tell me what my next thing is. My bad. <sighs> Okay, your next thing, Tiki. Sorry, I have it right here. Okay, yes, yeah, so, uh, Perfect Blue. Perfect Blue. Okay, okay. This is a. Uh, oh, this is an anime movie that I've been wanting to get to for a long time. Um, Dragon, let me tell you, uh, Ghibli. This is not in the best of ways. This is very, very different from from a Studio Ghibli type of anime movie. Um, This is a... It's full-on, like, psychological thriller. Um, It's directed by Satoshi Kon. Um, He also did uh, Tokyo Godfathers, as well as Paprika, which I will also talk about. Um, So this movie, it very much... um, is an exploration of fandom and it's like a horror movie involving fandom. So the main character is this pop idol in Japan and in Japan, pop idols are like, it's like a whole industry. Um, And she wants to make the transition from being a singer to being an actress. And long story short, dragon, that decision that she makes has a lot of ripple effects in the way that her fans and the public at large see her. And it um, it results in some pretty horrific stuff happening. Um, it's the really interesting thing about this movie, Dragon, is that this movie came out in, um, let me check, I believe it was 97. Yeah, 97. So the internet was in its infancy. 
And because of that, like, the, there is still, like, the, there is a fan page of the main character that essentially is written in the perspective of the main character. And it's, like, it's detailing elements of her life that, like, she has no idea. Like, it details, like, you know, for example, like, what time she went to the grocery store and what item she bought. You know what I mean? Like, like stuff that, like, how would this person that's writing this know this about her? And that is the very disquieting thing about it. Um, it, it very much deals in elements of, like, you know, like, like super fans stalking their, uh, you know, like, and uh, parasocial relationships and the danger of parasocial relationships and stuff like that. And, I mean, it is a twisty, turning narrative dragon. If I, I, I really can't sit here and lay out all the twists and turns along the way, um, because it's pretty complex. Um, it, it starts to get into, like, perspective, and it starts to get into, like, the whole idea of... I, actually, Dragon, a good way to put it is, uh, you know, you remember that BoJack Horseman season where he's filming the TV show and the TV yeah, show five. started to blend into his real life? Mm-hmm. This movie does a lot of that same stuff to the point where I'm pretty convinced that BoJack actually took inspiration from this movie because um, she is, uh, you know, she's shooting a TV show and it's very much like, you know, there's a lot of moments where it's like she's on set and she can't, you know, she, she as the movie goes on and as the uh, paranoia just ramps up and up and up, it's like she really is having a hard time distinguishing like what is what is the show that she's working on? What is a dream? What is reality? It plays with that whole perspective. It's got a really killer twist about um, who was actually behind the website. It's like genuinely an all-time great movie twist, in my opinion. And uh, yeah, uh, frankly, Dragon, this is one of the best anime movies I've ever seen. Really? Um. I mean, like I said, it's much, much, much different than anything Studio Ghibli. Like, it's very different from Studio Ghibli. But, I mean, it is hardcore. It's a hardcore, like, R-rated neo-noir thriller. And it is, like, incredibly ahead of its time with its commentary on the internet and fandom and parasocial relationships and everything. Hmm. Um, I, I'm not necessarily sure if you dig it the same way that I do dragon. Cause while it's not necessarily a horror movie, there are some pretty horrific elements to it, but I don't know, man, if you're curious, like I, I did thoroughly like this really blew me away. So yeah. Um, I would recommend it just on the, like if you're interested in like the, the, the deconstruction of parasocial relationships, that I'm laying out, then I think this is definitely worth a watch. If that's kind of like uh, perking your interest, I think I'll get to it eventually. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um. Next up, what's what do you got? Hollywood dreams and nightmares: the Robert England story. That's a hell of a title. It's pretty good, right? <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this was a Screenbox documentary, and I uh, gotta be honest, this and the RoboDoc thing I talked about last last month on Memoirs are the main reasons that I, the, the reasons I did the free trial for uh, for Screenbox. Uh huh. Yeah, I. Uh, yeah, this is uh, this is great. This is a top tier documentary on an actor's life. This 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 lived. This was uh, this was really good. This lived up to what I was hoping it was going to be. Um, England, you know, he's he's always been known for telling stories in the makeup chair, like and you know, talking people's ear off about all his Hollywood stories in the industry and everything. So this is this is kind of a takeoff on that, but it's very well edited. It's got some atmosphere, but it's it's a uh, it's a very the man's had a very interesting uh, career. You know, kind of. You know, it's kind of this, this very interesting career tale from, uh, you know, from, you know, his you know, humble beginnings to, you know, kind of where he goes. And the, the fact that, you know, he's, again, he was just kind of like a kind of a bit player and, you know, kind of rising up to uh, to getting this iconic, uh, you know, this, you know, becoming this this horror icon. Uh, but the fact that he was, you know, a beloved actor, you know, pre and post Freddy, and that's kind of what the, what the thing looks at as well. Which I really appreciated, you know. So, like, the only gripe I have is that skimped out on his voice work. That's like they cover mm -hmm. everything else but the voice work. It's like, come on, man. Yeah, the voice work always gets skimped out on, unfortunately. Yeah, but I mean, of course. 
I know this is a comparison you're not going to like, but the best aspect is that uh, as they kind of go through is like the man was kind of like a is, is like a, a had like a Forrest Gump kind of uh, kind of thing where he was he was kind of there during all the important moments of Hollywood history. Okay, well, to be fair, that's not the element of Forrest Gump I don't like. Well, I know. I'm just saying the name drop is what, yeah, I, know I probably won't appreciate the name drop, but that's essentially you know, kind of <laughs> when you have a, you know, it's like, it's the effect of Forrest Gump where he's like in the background of all of the historic pictures and stuff. Uh-huh, so uh-huh. That, in that respect, it's the idea like he, he was had, he was around during these huge moments in pop culture, which is really interesting when the movie go, goes on. It's like, wow, he was there during that. He had a role in that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, there's a lot of love. It's uh, it was a very satisfying, uh, very satisfying uh, documentary experience. I, I, I must say, and even they went they went pretty up to date with this. They cover Stranger Things. They cover uh, his appearance on the Goldbergs, even which I was impressed by. Mm. Nice, nice. So yeah, it was uh, this was this was another delight. I really enjoyed it. Cool, cool, cool. Okie dokie. Well, um, Joyride Dragon, not the uh, not the sex comedy from this year, but the 2001 thriller starring Paul Walker and Steve Zahn. Are you at all familiar with it? Uh, I, I don't. I don't think I see there's so many times I've seen Joyride because I'm always thinking of the Batman Beyond episode Joyride, but no, <laughs> I've not not seen. No. OK. Dragon, this is free on YouTube, actually. It's one of those, like, I, I feel like YouTube's been upping their free movie game recently. I don't know if you noticed that. Well, they should. Uh-huh. Um, so this is free on YouTube. And Dragon, I would thoroughly recommend that. Honestly, out of everything that I saw this month, I think this is the one that you would probably like the most. Because this is essentially a modern-day duel. Ooh. Mm-hmm. So essentially the premise of this is that uh, Paul Walker and Steve Zahn are uh, brothers, and they're taking a road trip. Uh, Paul Walker is trying to, uh, you know, trying to pick up his girlfriend along the way. They're taking a cross country road trip. Um, Steve Zahn actually, uh, Paul Walker wasn't intending to bring him along, but he needed to get bailed out of jail um, at the beginning of the movie, so that's why he's there. Paul Walker is basically just giving the brother a, you know, the, the whole the whole setup with their dynamic is that Paul Walker is kind of like, you know, the more sp- straight laced one, and Steve Zahn is kind of like the the problem child of the family. Uh, so essentially, they uh, they make the mistake of fucking with this truck driver over a radio. And now there is one element of the movie that's kind of a buy, which is just the fact that they have this radio to begin with, which they're just kind of using to fuck with truck drivers. It's just like, I I don't understand why they have it to begin with. Like the movie doesn't really do a good job of explaining why they have it It, beyond just like, Hey, it's something fun that Steve's on likes to do on road trips, I guess. But um, essentially dragon, they, uh, they con this one truck driver into, um, Paul Walker uses a voice, like a woman's voice, and basically, like, tricks a truck driver into going to a hotel for what he thinks is going to be, like, a, you know, like, a one-night stand with a female truck driver named Candy Cane, by the way, and I could not get Bob Odenkirk out of my head after that. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, But, uh, so essentially, Dragon... The truck driver is not is none too pleased with this uh, with this practical joke that has been played on him, and um, well, he he wants some revenge, and he's got a big old truck, a big old semi truck, a big old. It's not quite as intimidating as the truck from Duel, just because it doesn't have as much personality, but it's still pretty intimidating, and uh, he is chasing these kids throughout the countryside much like duel um the thing that this movie has that duel doesn't now I, i'm not saying this is a better movie than duel because it's definitely not duel is out of the two duel is definitely more artistically driven but the thing that this does have is that you know the whole element that they are able to communicate with this guy and Dragon, the voice of this guy, first of all, the guy's name is Rusty Nails, which is just such a great name for, like, a thriller villain. And he is voiced by Ted Levine, which hey! is it's a goddamn perfect choice, Dragon. It's it's just, it's perfect casting personified. 
And yeah, um, I mean, this movie's a ride for sure. I mean, you know, joy ride. So, you know, yeah. But yeah, Dragon, uh, like I said, it's not like, you know, don't go in expecting like the Spielbergian qualities that Duel has. But like, by and large, the setup is very similar to Duel, except, you know, you got a couple more characters being pursued and you've got a little bit more characterization. Like, like it's not like it's the truck itself that is the villain. It is Rusty Nails who is the villain. You do technically see Rusty Nails towards the end of the climax, but it's never, like, you never really get a good shot of him. Like, you don't get a close-up. And by and large, through, like, 95% of the movie, it is just Ted Levine's voice. So, yeah, um, definitely a uh, very much dual spiritual successor. I think you'd get a kick out of it. I would recommend it. All right. All right, next up, Who Done It? The Clue documentary. Is it uh, the board game, the movie, a little of both? Well, I mean, the movie, so they may have hair of the board games. And it opens up with them talking about the board game. So it's, it's the movie, though. It's about the movie. Okay. Yeah, so this is, uh, again, it was kind of on a, you know, it was on a screen box, cape with a lot of the horror documentaries. Because, you know, it's, that's the way I like to celebrate Halloween and October right. and stuff. So, yeah, uh, this is this one's more of a documentary on a budget. This is probably like kind of a low-tier Kickstarter sort of situation. I respect the ambition here. This is a guy who pretty much is obsessed with movie Clue, and he wanted to celebrate it, uh, celebrate the fandom of it. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty much it's a guy with a camera. It's got, it's got a real by-the-bootstraps charm to it. He's going there. He's interviewing the people. Uh, it's not the most flashy documentary, but it's uh, – yeah, you get some good interviews. Uh, the best interview being Michael McKeon. You know, he's there for a bit. You know, we're talking with him, and he's a good storyteller. He's also you. the best part of the movie. Yeah, he's great. <laughs> uh, now, uh, fortunately, uh, and they kind of they kind of cover this a little bit. Uh, you know, the the this was done during the pandemic, uh, so the uh, the guy, our our main documentarian here, he uh, he mentions he was supposed to interview Tim Curry, but he he got sick with COVID at the time. Not not Tim Curry, the the interviewer, so he could have to hit the bail on the interview. So they mm, usually like a. Nuts. They use like a clip from when he was at a convention and he was like talking about Clue very briefly, but it's like, oh, it's not great. You know, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, poor, but a poor guy. And he talks about it the thing, like, oh, we were going to, and then, you know, unfortunately. So, anyway, but uh, the point being, it's, it's talking about like the cult status and the longevity of, of the Clue film and the fact that the big theatrical gimmick of the, you know, it had three endings, depending on which theater you went to, it was seemingly a good gimmick to get people to watch it, maybe rewatch the movie, but ultimately it hurt more than it helped the film. You know, because people were like, I don't want to bother with like having to pick which one to get the ending. I'm just going to go to a movie mm-hmm. that has, actually has one ending, so that really hurt them in the end. So, that's the thing. So that's you know, it's, uh, it's 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 pure and simple. I'd say you know it's more of a comfort watch sort of thing. Though if you really want to, if you really want to know about Clue, I'd say well this is the best Clue documentary you're gonna find. But that, that's it, it's in uh, not in stiff competition. Yeah, I mean honestly, now that you mentioned Curry, I'm kind of surprised there's not like a proper uh, Rocky Horror documentary because that's a, there's a lot of material. I mean there might be Tiki, but I couldn't not that I saw. I mean, I, I if there is, it, like, I don't think there's like a definitive one. I think if there is, it's probably like a low budget one. But sure. All right. And they t- okay. they talk about it a little in this though. Uh huh. All right. Paprika. Um, this is again done by uh, Satoshi Khan, who, uh, by the way, Dragon. This guy only made like five movies, and then he died in his forties. So very, like, he died like tragically young, and he was very, very uh innovative when it came to uh you know animation um dragon this is very much like nolan himself admits that this movie was basically the inspiration behind inception Ah. um so it it very much deals with the concept of like dreams and espionage within you know going into people's dreams and stuff like that um the animation is gorgeous. There is some really great creativity here. The real building is pretty insane. Unfortunately, I kind of feel like I don't like this one nearly as much as Perfect Blue, just because for me, Perfect Blue hit so hard because 
because of how realistic it was and how ahead of its time it was. And obviously with this very much being like a sci-fi dream movie, it just doesn't have that, you know, that same power to it. Um, it's very good. But as far as a movie about dreams goes, I even though I think the visuals in this movie are a little bit more creative, I think Inception's plot is a lot better realized. This plot, I'm not going to lie, it's a little messy. It's it's a little all over the place. It kind of reminds me of what you were saying about um, Nausicaa and the Valley of the Wind, where it's like, you know, like like the plot is happening and it's a very high concept world and stuff, but you're not necessarily attached to the characters all that much. And for me, the big sin of it is that it tries to uh, it tries to do a romance, and the romance takes up a big chunk of the story. <laughs> That's very unfortunate. Um, I could definitely see people liking this better than Perfect Blue if you know if they're mostly in it for the visual component to it. But even though I like this quite a bit, I, it definitely was a little bit of a letdown compared to uh, Perfect Blue, especially given the, uh, you know, the Inception tie-in. Like I said, I think as a film, I like Inception a lot more. So, you know, I, I don't want to call this a disappointment, Dragon. I really don't. But, uh, you know, again, like Perfect Blue just kind of knocked my socks off. And this was just kind of like, yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> so kind of the difference between the two there all righty it's next for you another horror documentary you got it pennywise the story <laughs> of it so i've seen this on prime a lot so yeah. tell me this is actually worth watching it oh man it's so totally worth watching this really is really good yeah I seriously guess. what you should watch especially since it's on prime you don't have to sign it's it's, it's also on screen box but the fact that it's on prime is quite beneficial um yeah, this is a great in-depth doc on the making of the TV movie. Uh, and Tim Curry, actually, you do interview Tim Curry in this one. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> it's got an actual interview. Uh, you know, gets and talks about the Rocky, the little Rocky Horror Picture stuff as well. Uh, it's, it's, um, it shows you, you know, uh, you know, the, there's a lot of time spent on, you know, the bonding process between the kids and their adult counterparts is how they kind of got the, the performances really nailed down there. Um, you know, you have like, you know, Tim Curry very much as the secret weapon of the movie and like how he was very key in the makeup process. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, there was, uh, you know, they were everyone being kind of dis they covered the, how everyone was kind of disappointed by the spider in the ending and everything. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, that's kind of a problem with the book, too, honestly. Yeah, so that's they really get around that. Yeah, and they cover that uh, a little bit in there. Uh -huh, uh -huh. well. So, yeah, this was, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was great. I mean, I forget how. Uh, I think I forget if it's like two hours or not. I mean, I like long horror documentaries, so I don't. Uh, it's, it's no problem if it is that. But it, yeah, this was. Uh, this is very. I, I enjoyed the Pennywise uh, documentary. Cool. All right, Dragon. I'm going to go ahead and switch um, the two Saw movies, switch the order of them that you have, just because my feelings on Saw Two are very much colored by my experience with Saw X. So if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and talk about Saw X first. So uh, yeah, Saw X Dragon. This was my first experience with a Saw movie in a movie theater and only the second Saw movie that I have seen overall. Um, I saw the original Saw on a whim um, a long time ago. And Dragon, I, I, I fucking honestly love saw x um much like jason x which i know we're gonna get to it's weird that it's you know it is my favorite like well i don't want to say it's my favorite in the franchise because it's i i obviously haven't seen a large chunk of these movies yet but by all intents and purposes dragon pretty much everyone who has seen this has said it is the best of the franchise um the really cool thing about this is that all the other Saw movies, you are not following Jigsaw. Jigsaw is not the main character. He is very much in the background controlling things. Here, Jigsaw is front and center, and you spend the first act of this movie in his shoes to the point where essentially the whole setup for this thing is that... Um, John Kramer, which is, you know, the, the, the guy Jigsaw, um, 
he is uh, the whole the whole thing with his character is that he has terminal cancer, and that's why he's doing what he's doing with the traps and everything. Is that essentially his whole thing? Is that he? It's very much an extreme version of you know, like be thankful for what you have in life. Like essentially, like you play his game. And if you survive, then you're going to have a, a whole new outlook on how good it is to be alive. Twisted logic, for sure, and he does target people who deserve it, for the most part. Um, but essentially, because he is, you know, a terminal cancer patient, like, the first act of this movie is from that perspective. Like, you're seeing him, you're seeing him go to support groups, and you're seeing him you know, in the hospital and, you know, trying to, uh, trying to figure out how to beat this thing. And it's, it's honestly very compelling. Um, and so essentially he gets hooked up with this, uh, this experimental new cancer treatment facility in Mexico. And to make a long story short, Dragon, it is a total scam. They, uh, they do this, uh, basically this song and dance quote unquote operation where they mostly just put him under and not really do a whole bunch of anything. And then they show him some fake test results and dragon. He finds out that the whole thing is a scam and he is none too happy. And then the second half of the movie is just trap city. And uh, I will say this much dragon. One of the traps in particular, it was the closest that I have ever come to vomiting in a movie theater. Really? Yes. Like, I, I I was pretty close. Like, it was pretty, pretty gnarly. Um, So, I'm not really a torture porn body horror guy at all. But I will say that, you know, the emphasis on John Kramer as a main character and, like, you know, going through... Like, you are essentially in his shoes with the whole, you know, like, scam operation thing. So, you want, you you viscerally want to see these people get taken down. And it is very satisfying. Um, my only complaint with this movie is that I do think that the final trap is pretty underwhelming. Like, they have all these elaborate elaborate things going on, and then the final trap is literally just two people are locked in a room and the room starts filling with poisonous gas. And there's like, there's like a hole in the wall of the room that you need to stick your head in. But the catch is that, you know, the two people in the room are our husband and wife and they have to fight for who gets to stick their head in the hole to survive the gas. It's, you know, interesting idea, but it's kind of like, it's by far the least creative trap in the movie. So it doesn't really end things off on the highest note, but everything else surrounding it, like from the first act build up to most of the other traps in the movie, which were just pretty insane and creative and like just very captivating in how they're executed and shot. Um, this was a huge surprise for me, man. I really, uh, Honestly, I just kind of went into this because it was getting good reviews and because, like, I, I I saw this the weekend that I would have seen the Exorcist movie. Had, by all intents and purposes, everything I've heard about the new Exorcist movie is terrible. I will probably watch it eventually, but I am not going to watch it in a theater, I'll say that much. So this was a big surprise for me, man. I, I just kind of, like, had a craving to watch a good horror movie in a theater. I had no idea what to expect. Um... Honestly, like, the Saw movies are kind of known for having a very complicated lore behind them. But I feel like this is one of those horror sequels where it's like, it gets back to the basics. Like, you know, you understand all that you need to know. There's there's probably a couple characters, a couple plot points that I was a little bit mixed on. But I was able to come into this as a relative newcomer of the franchise and still really love it. Uh, I thought it was a hell of a time in the movie theater. I was... I was kind of out of breath by the end of it, honestly. So, yeah. Obviously, obviously nothing that you're ever going to watch. You know, like, the Saw movies are very much, like, the opposite of your taste. But, yeah, for me, I did quite enjoy it. Um, honestly, it'll probably be in my uh, in my top ten. Because it's just, it, it, it was that visceral. It, it was pretty thrilling. Whew. Okay, last horror doc, Dragon. What do you got? Scream Queen. 
My Nightmare on Elm Street. Okay. Yeah, this is a uh, this is this is kind of like in a weird way. This is kind of like a spinoff, or like a supplemental documentary to uh, Never Sleep Again, the Nightmare on Elm Street documentary, the four hour. Right. One. It's it's uh, I say that because it follows um, Mark Patton. Mark Patton was the uh, was the male, uh, essentially the male final girl from uh, from Nightmare on Elm Street Two. He was uh, I think Jesse, Jesse the uh, you know like the main character from there. I remember I, I don't know if you recall from the documentary that the infamy of Nightmare Two was that it kind of incidentally was like the first. It was it was kind of like the first gay uh, one of the first gay horror films ultimately. Um, Basically, the idea is there's a lot of there's a lot of homosexual un- undertones in in night in Nightmare Two that were kind of like and over the years it was kind of this thing of apparently it was, it was speculated like was it intentional or was it there? Whereas when you look back at the movies, like yeah, it feels pretty intentional. It feels like it's there's a lot of no subtlety there. And uh, but here's the interesting angle the move this documentary approaches to is that this had a very profound impact on Mark Patton, the actor who was gay in real life, but that wasn't known when he was doing the movie. So this guy, this is, this is this young actor's first big movie and he's labeled, you know, essentially he's, he's practically outed, you know, Mm -hmm. with this movie. So he's labeled, you know, like it's the gay nightmare on Elm Street. Right, right, right. Yeah. And, all of that, like all of that buzz, and just you know, like the, the people are a little deflated from the first one. Made a lot of money because everyone's going to go to the second one after they saw the first movie. All of that buzz landed on his shoulders because of the the writer of the film. Uh, the writer of the film said, like, no, that was just because of casting. I, that wasn't intentional. And years later, he admitted, like, yeah, it was a little intentional. So the fact is, this poor actor kind of had to shoulder a lot of that blame. And he kind of went into hiding in Mexico, apparently. Uh, for for never sleep again because he's in that documentary. Uh, they they kind of they kind of lowered they kind of found him like all the way hiding in Mexico so they get everyone from the Nightmare on Elm Street cast in that in that documentary. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's a solid doc with an emotional uh, through line. There's a big confrontation scene. T. That's the most interesting. He go he confronts that writer in this documentary. Mm. It's it yeah it it builds the it's so there's some tension there. So there's some palatable tension there where mm. you don't know how this is gonna go. And uh, and yeah, so it's um, it's an interesting watch, man. It's good, especially if you like Never Sleep Again, which I suspect you did. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. Who? Okay, last one for me. We got Saw Two. Um, this before Saw X was pretty much uh, regarded as the best Saw movie. And watching it, Dragon, I can see how it's a considerable step up from the first movie, just as far as the scale goes. Because, like, the thing with the first Saw movie is that it's kind of, it's it's pretty different from the rest of the Saw movies. Because the rest of the Saw movies are like a series of traps, and the first Saw movie is very much just like, Guy has to saw off his leg, and that's why it's called saw, and that's the trap, and it's very straightforward, very cut and dry. This starts to get into, like, you know, the more elaborate traps, multiple traps, um, the the cast of characters is a lot bigger. Um, It's certainly good, I certainly like it a lot better than the original Saw, but honestly, Dragon, I was spoiled with Saw X, I really was, I... And that's kind of, like, honestly so much so that watching Saw 2, like, kind of caught me dead in my tracks of, like, re-watching all the other ones. Because I'm like, man, it's like, if this is the best one besides Saw X, like, I like this movie, but I definitely don't love it in the same way that I love Saw X. Um, I mean, a couple of really big factors here. Obviously, the main one is that, You know, the fact of the matter is that Saw X was the first Saw movie to really focus almost exclusively on Jigsaw, and that is, like, a big thing. Like, you know, you just don't have that in in Saw 2. You really don't. And, uh, like, for most of the Saw movies, from what I understand, there's basically, like, two plots going on. There's, like, a plot where, you know, you're following the traps and everything going on there, and then there's also, like, a a side plot with detectives who are trying to find the people. And by and large, I've heard from the, uh, from the Saw fan base that the, uh, the, the detective plots in the Saw movies are very forgettable and kind of disposable. Very much felt that way here. 
Um, you know, I mean, there's definitely uh, there's definitely some memorable traps here, but also I feel like this movie has like a much more dated like music video style editing and look to it compared to Saw X, which is a lot more modern in its filmmaking approach. So yeah, like I said, it's, you know, it's definitely better than the first Saw movie, just as far as like, there's a lot more going on with it, but uh, it is no Saw X and I don't really think I'm even all that interested in watching any of the other Saw movies if this is like the high bar beside Saw X. So yeah. All right, take a sat, Dragon. Right. Well, you know, I have two more to give it. Yeah, I know, I know. Jason X. Uh, okay, long story. Basically, Jason X I meant to put on last, uh, technically I meant to put on last month, but it kind of fell off by accident. Long story short, first Jason movie I saw all the way through. Uh, you know, I dig the future in space setting. Uh, it's it's a farce for sure, which is the main reason I was able to watch it. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, it's the dead end era of horror when you put them in space. And it's very much like them saying, yeah, we need the stall until Freddy versus Jason. So we're having fun with it. Uh-huh. Got some great kills. Uh, you know, uh, admittedly missed opportunity after the, the great first 10 minutes set up of, of the film. It's like, hey, we have a Jason expert in the future who could actually help these these poor, hapless, sex-crazed future teams. And then she but, becomes uh, pretty much the most worthless character in the whole movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, like... Uh, I mean, look, right, the writing on the slasher movies has never been Yates, but, you know, I appreciated the humor. I, I Want to smoke some pot? <laughs> I... I Let's have some premarital sex. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I love. Uh, I gotta be honest though, I do really appreciate that we like we, the we have a relationship in this movie between the young man and the robot girlfriend, and it's oddly the most wholesome Friday the Thirteenth relationship <laughs> we've ever had in any of these movies. Like the most wholesome. He he's like he's not pushing for it. She's a robot. You uh-huh. know? It's like it's a whole it's a whole thing, and it's. <laughs> And she gets to take out Jason at least initially. Oh so there's a, there's a lot there. She gets the she technically is killed by Jason and lives. Yep. And she's a robot yep. head. That's <laughs> think about how unique that is. Yeah, I, I as you know, Dragon. I've all I've long since had um, affection for Saw or for Saw for Jason X. Um, first R-rated movie I ever saw yeah. in theater. So it's always going to hold a special place in my heart in that regard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, and lastly, The Exorcist. All right, I'm dying to know. How did you handle it, Dragon? Did you handle it okay? I mean, yeah, the cross scene was a little brutal, but... uh, Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. So I think so. uh, The Exorcist, uh, iconic, successful film, admittedly not my go-to. It's not my go-to. Uh, you know, it's uh, for me. I, mean, I love it, but even I think that the uh, like the actual making of is like even more fascinating. Well, that's the thing. I'm sure I would have blown away by a documentary on the making of The Exorcist, but I did. I did not uh, did not have that. I just watched the movie itself. Um, I gotta be honest. I have this thing with Freakin's work sometimes, where he he really loves the slow burn, and uh, in this case, I I think it really drags until the last until the third act. I think it drags until. The last 40 minutes and last 40 minutes is amazing. And there's the actual exorcism. I, I can't say I agree with that. I'm just, not saying there's anything wrong with what we get up to that point. Well, it's I'm just, saying I, for me personally, like a lot of the true scariness of this movie comes from the buildup comes from the fact that, you know, like you see the slow metamorphosis of the character. Yeah. Well, I mean, I like how we build up to it. Don't get me wrong. I like how we see like the natural thing of like she has like little scratches on her face and that kind uh-huh, of thing. Uh-huh. Like, that's good. And I like the mother being exhausted all over all of her things to, to get to the point where okay, I'm going to turn to religion. Like that's fine. I don't know. It just I don't, I don't know. It just feels like overall, it's just it, it's a lot of movie before we get to like the core title of the film. I don't know. Mm-hmm. And it's like they're they're kind of disparate elements that don't really I don't think collide naturally i don't know because it feels like we have a priest just it's kind of wandering by the set and then you know it kind of happens to very casually know the mother i don't know what's just kind of happens anyway uh the performances hold up uh the ending is uh, the ending is utterly perfect that's the endings i I love that last four i love the core thing in the movie it's great um 
yeah, just um, you know, like, again, like the, you know the, uh, the. It's just to me at the end of the day, look, it's great. It's just no French connection for me at the end of the day for me. But it's uh, it, the, the move, the movie itself, though. Again, I can see why it, it it earns the hype. It does. It's just again, I've, I I got weird horror taste. You know, it's just not not my good. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. All right. Best and worst. Why don't you go first? Okay. For me, the best was definitely um, Perfect Blue. Uh, Perfect Blue, like, really blew me away. Um, As far as worst goes, it's a little trickier because, honestly, really nothing that I saw I disliked. Like, it's not like I'm going to say, you know, Bride of Frankenstein didn't wasn't didn't exactly meet my expectations but it's not like i'm going to say that's the worst um oh god i honestly i would probably have to say just by default um old dads but dragon i want you to know it's like it's not like i hate the movie by any means it's it's probably either old dads or five nights at freddy's but it's hard for me to say that something with such good jim henson puppets is the worst so gonna have to go with old dads just by default hmm. well uh okay so best for me i think it's kind of a tie between uh hollywood hollywood dreams and nightmares the robert england story and uh the killers of the flower moon hmm. um <laughs> two very comparable movies <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, worst. Uh, I, I didn't really have anything offensively bad in movies, uh, but uh, for that, I, I'd say probably. I think the week. I hate. I hate to say it, but I mean, Pain Hustlers is. I mean, it's Pain Hustlers is kind of the most unnecessary of the bunch. It's not really a bad, but it just feels like. Again, we kind of have it done better in two TV shows. You know, it's just sure, kind of like sure, an unneeded sure. thing. I mean. I, I really I old dads again it's not yet it's not trying to reinvent the wheel but I I, I laughed you know it's a lot of good laughs I laughed <laughs> made me laugh you loved our movie Conan you laughed <laughs> sorry that's a that's a South Park movie reference sounds more like a James Corden reference <laughs> oh god the way the way you deliver it sounds like a James Corden reference <laughs> all right anyway so is that about it yeah that's about it. Okay, well, big thanks to Co Gias, Keeper Colby, and Little Blue for joining us in the comments tonight. You all rock. And do 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 do. That's it for. Wait, let me let me actually read this. Yeah, no. Okay, I'm starting over, Dragon. I'm starting over. Well, folks, we've locked, we've waxed on long enough, and it's time to put the pen down. Until next time, when we return for another fitting chapter in our movie memoirs. Ah.